Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we have our episode two of House of the Dragon pre-show and I am delighted and honoured to say that my special guest today is none other than Aziz from History of Westeros. Do you want to say hi and introduce yourself to anyone who doesn't know who you are? I sure do. Thanks for having me, Robert. We're doing some fun work for a good cause today. Very happy to be here. I am Aziz from History of Westeros podcast. You might have seen me uh, my name on some of Robert's videos. We do a lot of collabing. And of course, I've been on some live streams before. And Robert's been on our channel as well, History of Westeros. We're just so excited that there's new material. The fandom is so energized right now. Uh, I think if you asked some of us a few years ago if we'd ever be back here with this level of interest in this fandom, I think there would have been some doubt. But that those doubts are now already a thing of the past, one week later. So yeah, things are good. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing quite how quickly things have turned around from people being suspicious and still on a down from the end of Game of Thrones all this time later to excited and energized. Um, and it was just so amazing. Just this last week, on places like Twitter, everyone just happily talking about what what they've watched and saying how much they enjoyed it. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, so yes, yeah, as he's mentioned just a moment ago, uh, this live stream, in fact, all of the live streams I'm going to be doing as pre-show live streams for House of the Dragon and the Rings of Power are going to be in aid of Alzheimer's care and research. Alzheimer's uh, is a horrible disease. Uh, if you've uh, ever come across it in any of your loved ones, then you will know quite how horrible it is. Um, so if you are able and uh, if you would like to, then please do uh, give generously. There's a, a, a button there somewhere on your screen right now. It'll be uh, open even if you're watching this uh, back later. Okay, so before we get into the actual the episode itself, I think we'll probably do a bit of a wrap up of, of episode one and then look forward to episode two two um just a couple of quick things i want to say rings of power if you are like me a massive tolkien fan and the rings of power is going to be on our screens laptops wherever you're going to watch it um thursday friday it's coming on thursday at 9 p.m eastern time so that's my time 2 a.m in the morning on the friday um and the first two episodes will be dropping at the same time there are lots of oh. Uh, free uh, sort of screeners uh, out there for uh, for people to go to. So I imagine quite a lot of people will have seen it even before then. I'm, I've been lucky enough to get into one of them as well. Um, so I'm really excited and looking forward to this. So it's been a long wait. It is the world's biggest budget TV show ever. So ever. <laughs> soon, soon we will know whether it, whether the money has been well spent. Uh, Aziz, are you? I, I'm not sure if I've ever asked you. Are you? A, I know you're a Tolkien fan, but are you sort of looking forward to this? Yeah, very much so. I'm. I didn't realize two episodes were dropping at once. That's so cool. Um, it's amazing how much is happening at once. Not only do we have House of the Dragon and and Rings of Power, but there's also this interview with the Vampire Show and this Andor Show from Star Wars. So it's it's incredible how much is going on. But yeah, I've read all the Tolkien books. I've read the Silmarillion a long time ago. I don't remember it very well. So I'm definitely not in in deep as you are, <laughs> ha, pun. But I am very excited for it. I'm I'm excited to reimmerse myself in something that I haven't been on top of lately so it's going to be semi new to me and that's a great thing get to be surprised <laughs> well i think it is going to be semi new to everyone because this is um yeah, that's true <laughs> it's not an adaptation this is not isn't a new cover of the lord of the rings books this is effectively a sort of a prequel many thousands of years earlier a sort of an origin story for where did the rings of power come from so that's the idea right but tolkien didn't write huge amounts about that period um it has to be said and to add to the complications amazon haven't got the rights to all of the things where he was writing about it like the silmarillion for example they don't technically have the rights to the silmarillion so what we're seeing mm. is uh, is new Almost there are characters we know, there are scenarios that we know, there are some huge kind of like uh, tempos that Tolkien put in there about the creation of the rings and so on and so forth. But the stories interweaving uh, between those things, that is all new. So it's going to be... Um, 
hopefully uh, a, a fantastic little adventure. Um, yeah. But that's all uh, looking forward to. I will be doing pre-show live streams for them. My usual Thursday live streams are pre-show live streams for that. But nice. one of the reasons I wanted oh, Aziz yeah. on here, and I suspect one of the reasons why some people are tuning in, is because... Um, I, yeah, you dropped it just a, a few days ago, maybe a week or so ago, but a couple of weeks, three weeks ago, you had the opportunity to talk to the big man himself, George R.R. Yeah. R. Martin. Um, I would highly recommend, there's a link to History of Westeros down in the description. Please do go and uh, check out the the interview. It's about an hour and a quarter, I think, off the top of my head. And it yep. is, I, I would say, one of the most important interviews he's given for quite some time uh, partly because he hasn't given many interviews <laughs> for quite a while <laughs> but also partly because he does open up about uh, a lot of important issues to do with canon and what's his role in the uh, the tv shows but i wanted just to give you uh, just the the floor for a moment as he's uh, how is he what what did you, what were your reactions what were the big things that you got from this interview well, yeah, thanks for that great setup, Robert. Yeah, we did. It was a couple of weeks ago. We flew to Santa Fe and interviewed him in his office house. He has multiple houses, one of which he works in, one of which he lives in. They're not far from each other. So he just walks between them a lot of times, apparently. And that's nice. But he, he seems in very good spirits. I think that this is my own personal guess, but the weight of House of the Dragon is, is significant on him, even though he's not writing scripts it's still his baby and having since have it come out and be received very well and both his own opinion on it is very positive i feel like that's a weight lifted off of him i don't know that for sure i'm not in his head but it seems stands to reason that that would be a pretty big deal something weighing on his mind so i think uh a lot of things are looking up for him he has greater control over what's going to happen in the future of his series not full control obviously he hbo has actual creative control that's something he clarifies in the interview but he has uh, a big contract with them for several years of developing new stories in his world and that's something he's always wanted to do and it's really filled him with new new life i suppose um hollywood's tricky and they often put you in limbo and, and just would rather pay you more than ask your opinion on things. So George has found himself a little higher on the ladder than he was before with that regard. And I think that's, I think that's helping him on a personal level, feel better about it all because so having things out of your control when you put so much effort into it and having so many people scrutinize it and not even know the difference between what's yours and what's HBO's that's probably I mean, there are bigger problems to have in this life, but that's yeah. <laughs> still that as a as a creator, you know, you can I think we can maybe sympathize a little bit with the position he's in, but he's just a great person. He's a nice man. I mean, people have said that before, but it's really true. He is engaging. He likes to tell stories. He likes to talk. He's not uh, he doesn't have a star attitude like someone who behaves like he's better than other people he's not like that at all he's very down to earth i mean he is very successful there's no getting around that his house is he's got stained glass windows of different house sigils so <laughs> i can't say he lives a life of a normal person in some ways but he is despite that he is very down to earth and yeah it was just really fun to talk to him he's the our only challenge was trying to get in additional questions because if you ask him something, he's, he's likely just to, he's a natural storyteller. He's likely to just go off for five or 10 minutes. So we just had to kind of corral him a little bit <laughs> occasionally, yeah. but, but yeah, it, it was so nice. So we were so um, honored that he was willing to do that, to sit down in his own house and then get to look at his miniatures and all his displays Shay pointed out that I, would, I kept getting distracted when we were setting up the microphones because I would be like, ooh, look at this. And she's like, focus. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, yeah, you're right. We have time to look at this afterwards, which which we did that, too. So, <laughs> yeah, it was just a, a great experience. A lot of people have said, was it like a career defining moment for you? And I would have to say, yes, yes, it was. It it was a very much a high point. 
And and I think I mean I'm not I'm not alone. I've seen a lot of other people say I, I think he knocked it out of the park. I thought it was an, an excellent interview. It was it was coming at it from a slightly different angle to how a, a few other uh, people have have done that in the past. You deliberately didn't ask the the, the questions that he was just going to knock away. Like how are you <laughs> doing on the winds of winter? When you're going to make that kind of thing, which was uh, which was really good and refreshing. Um, th there were a couple of things I just wanted to. Uh, just tease out from you that I, I know he talked about. Um, people ask about this a lot. What is his role? Because he did talk about this. His role on the shows, in particular on this show, House of the Dragon. Does he? You talked about creative control. Does this mean? Does he have veto on anything? Does he get a chance to put in ideas? Who's who's actually? Uh, when we see stuff, is this coming from him? What's the what's the role there in terms of? how he fits into this great question so one of the ways we can explain this is to try to compare it to game of thrones and what level of control he had there versus now and do maybe a little bit of a side by side in neither case did he have creative control he's not the showrunner the showrunners make those decisions and of course the studio has some say in certain high level things that they want to see included or not included maybe they have a few dictates that they that come from the top uh but george back in game of thrones time it was more he signed off on the project and they took it and ran with it and asked his advice on a few things but most of that advice was early on one thing he says in the interview is by the end he didn't really have not only were they not talking to him much but he didn't really have much idea what was going on and this time around it's a similar setup, except for he is higher ranked in HBO's uh, hierarchy, and he had a much bigger say on who was involved in this in the first place. They're still Ryan Condal and Miguel Sapochnik are in charge, but they listen to George more than Dan and Dave did, apparently. So far, obviously, who knows what's going to happen in the future, but if listening to him pays off, they'll probably keep doing that. And I think that was a, an important aspect of, of this choice in the first place of who to be showrunners because they wanted to, they wanted people to listen to George more. They wanted, that seems to be a vibe that we got. And George knew Ryan Condal since 2014. He, he says that he was sort of his pick for this. And it's almost like George hired him. That's not strictly true because George doesn't have hiring and firing power. But George christened this choice and his word goes farther than it did with the first show. So there, he's still a cons basically gives advice and says, I think you'll make a mistake if you do this or you should include this. Like George told them that it would probably be a mistake not to include Jane Poole in the first Game of Thrones. And that did cause a ripple effect, the butterfly effect he likes to talk about. And I think we'll see less of the butterfly effect in, in in House of the Dragon for a number of reasons. One, they're listening to him more. Two, the source material is complete. So that's a whole other aspect to this, that they're not having to make things up on their own nearly as much. So that's a hugely important consideration. But yeah, he weighs in on what canon is and how he, he expects there to be going forward to be two versions of canon. There's the show canon and the book canon. A lot well, of times Can I come on to the canon bit in just one moment? Because I Absolutely, think this, yeah. is, this is a really important point about canon. But but just to sort of round off where we are in terms of uh, his cr creative control, he talked quite a bit about creative control. He doesn't have creative control in, in his words, right. which means that the people in charge are the showrunners. And at the moment... He's got a good relationship with uh, both of the showrunners, as far as we can tell. That seems to be working really well. They're taking on board what he says. That, we hope, is going to be the case for other other spin-offs that are probably going to be coming down the line. Um, but we can't guarantee it. So he right. does not have veto. He could, They could make anything. They've paid for the rights for it. They've got the rights to do what they want in his world. They could make anything. But at the moment, it seems to be that they've realized that actually sticking as close as you can to what George R. R. Martin says seems to be the right path to be going down, which is positive. And for anyone who missed it, they have renewed House of the Dragon for season two. I probably should have said that at the beginning. This was <laughs> probably the most uh, straightforward decision they've made for quite some time. This was the biggest um, debut of in 
HBO history. This was huge. Um, it, the, the, in terms of the raw numbers, I think it was something like half of the the finale or the overnight figures anyway were like half of the finale of season eight but that is still many times higher than anything else they've had since season eight of game of thrones because that was the biggest tv show of all time <laughs> so they are massively happy about this and although they've obviously not said anything i think this has to increase the likelihood that some of these other projects are going to be greenlit at some point soon, I would have thought. Very true. That if it had been a massive failure, then the answer would be, no, we're not doing anything more. It's a big hit, so I think there's now quite a good chance we will, at some point soon, hear about one or more of them getting uh, pushed forward. Yeah. But I want to get onto this that. canon thing, <laughs> because this, sure. I think, was the, the, the key thing. People... Uh, often asking, so if something happens in House of the Dragon, does this mean that this is now true? Is this the true telling of exactly what happens in Fire and Blood? Um, is something, if some bit of lore gets revealed in House of the Dragon, is that true for the book universe as well? George R. Martin, I think, gave a very clear answer, but I'd love to hear it sort of from you, what you, you think this now answer is what canon what is canon in his mind right on yeah first off shout out to my partner shea she is a big part of the reason why that interview is so smooth she did did a lot of extra work up front on the technical side and then on the back end to do the subtitling and she made sure every word was spelled properly like he used a lot of proper nouns and she looked all of them up to make sure everything <laughs> was spelled right so uh having it be accessible was was important a big part of the goal there so yeah the canon explanation is pretty important. You're right. It's it's something that a lot of fandoms deal with. Some fandoms have it worse than this. And you know, like, for example, Star Wars had canceled a whole bunch of publications and is re re bringing some of them back. Uh, if you have ever dealt with the Witcher fandom, there's like three game canons and a book yep. canon and a show canon. It's it can be really tricky. So, um it's important to define these things. Like you said, George does not consider the TV show as the true canon. It's the show canon. It is influenced heavily by book canon. It's um, probably more so than Game of Thrones was, almost certainly more so, but we're only one episode in, so it's maybe premature to say that, <laughs> but that is apparently the goal. So the goal is to have two separate canons, the show canon, which will eventually include, like you said, the ripple effect of the success of House of the Dragon is that it makes these other shows that George prefers to call successor shows a lot more likely to happen. Multiples of them, perhaps. There's a lot of them in development. And the, you're right. The more this first one does well, the more it fuels the other ones. It fuels everything. It's a huge ripple effect. I mean, us here talking about it today is in part because of the quality of it and the expectations it's set for the rest. But all the other successor shows, they're they want to do a concerted workable universe where the details line up where you have that's using star Wars as an example. One of the reasons they had to cancel the old Canon was because it wasn't, there was no concerted effort to make it all work together. These were just individual authors writing their own stories with no connection to each other. So there's, there would be overlap, right? They're not, there's no central control over, making it all functional and consistent with it within itself. That is what they want to do here. Not unlike the newer version of the star Wars universe or the Marvel universe where, or, or any of these other large uh, properties that have consistency within all their stories. If something happens in one movie or one story, it's reflected in the others. They don't want to have a story about the sea snake that doesn't include details that were included in house of the dragon that would be sloppy that would be not what we want and if they get that right it's very powerful because we fans we want that and if they and there's very few examples of that out there in the world where it's consistent and significant because for one thing it's hard to put all this together you got to have a big studio and buy-in of a lot of executives and obviously these kinds of huge fandoms don't exist very easily so it's it, 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 we're hearing all the things we want to hear. Obviously, the execution is another matter. But if all these success, if some of these successor shows happen and they're well in alignment, their lore and the actions line up with the other shows, 
that is going to make things really good for the future. And we're all going to have a lot to talk about going forward. It makes me feel very positive about it all. Yeah. And what I took from this is that George R. Martin, I think he put it in one of his not a blog posts ages ago, something like I see my job with all of this is to keep things as canonical as possible. And that kind of raised all these questions. Well, what do you think canon is? I think we've now got clarity that he thinks he's got two roles here. The first one was, uh, as you say, we've got show canon, which is all of these different shows that they're in the same kind of canon universe to try and keep them as lined up as possible. The second role is to try and make sure that each of those is as close as possible to book canon. That doesn't mean that they are the same thing. There, there will be differences, but he wants them to be as close as possible. So I, I, that, that seems to be where he's at. He did. I found it quite interesting that he, he clearly had this interest. I think it might have been Shaya who said, who I agree did a fantastic job. So uh, well done, Shaya. Um, the, uh, he, she started talking about how in, I think it's in Star Wars, they, they have like a group that does this that actually gets down and, and talks to each other about making sure that all of the different books and the TV shows and the films, they all uh, work together. And he seemed quite interested in that. So I do wonder whether or not he might think, hang on, do I have to do all of this myself? Or can I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the story group. It's so it is a really good, yeah. You know, uh, evolution of creation, yeah. I guess we we'll call it. And this is this is where uh, I think where we're moving from. This is just him doing his stuff. To this is now potentially a kind of a a universe, uh, an expanded universe in some way. And once it gets to that point, that's more of a full time job keeping a track of all of these things. So it's perhaps not all for him. Um, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I want to get on to talk about the well, the House of the Dragon stuff in a moment. But is there anything else that you would like to really highlight from that that conversation you mm. had that you think that people should know or would like to know uh, about you know what what he was talking about? Well, I I think that yeah, I think you're right that he maybe wasn't fully aware of some of the techniques that are being used. But you're right that he seems to want this for his universe. He said when he makes comments like, well. The thing about world building is if you do it really well, you have a world <laughs> and there's lots of stories in, in in a world, not just the big stories and not just the smaller stories. And I think that's an important consideration is it's really hard to get get a existing world story that mm-hmm. is low key and takes its time um, without because a lot of times these big shows expect uh, the dragons and the big stories the epics but if it's successful enough there's room for the smaller scale stories too and i think that's something that we would all really like to have as well if we get a story that's from the perspective of maybe common people or people who aren't nobles or uh, one of the free cities or something like that that would be really fun but it wouldn't and it wouldn't involve necessarily things like dragons. It would involve things that are more like character stories. So that's that's the kind of thing I think we should be thinking about in terms of setting expectations. Yes, there will probably be other stories with dragons and big and, and maybe white walkers and, and other large scale fantasy things like that. But there also is room if things continue to go well for lighter, not lighter, but um smaller scale but more intense uh, more personal maybe large smaller casts or just other areas on the map that are interesting that we haven't explored things that might surprise people so that's that's what i've been thinking about a lot is where else this will where else this will lead us to within the world and it's maybe a little premature to hope for some of those too much but i think that's where we're headed so file yeah, that away and he has he has said uh, that one of the things that he's looking for is for some of these spin-offs to have a, a different feel to them. So uh, we we know what the Game of Thrones slash House of the Dragon feel is. It's it's grey characters. It's quite dark. Uh, there's going to be violence. There's you know it's this is typical HBO fare. But he was kind of hinting that hey maybe 
some of these things might be slightly different. And we think of the, the sea snakes show, the sort of the, the nine voyages. This could be more like adventure on the high seas and see yeah. that kind of feel to it. And and uh, maybe one of them could just be a comedy. Maybe we could yeah. just go for, yeah. maybe we have a rom com <laughs> set in, in, in another world of ice and fire. I don't know, but he's he clearly liked this idea that you could have different because he doesn't another thing which came out from this, uh, which he said a lot. Yes, he's now famous as being this huge fantasy writer, but that's not all he's ever written. He used to be a sci-fi writer. He's written some horror stories. It's a Fever Dream is a fantastic story if you ever want to read another George R. R. Martin story. So Hi, he sorry. doesn't just mm -hmm. see himself as writing high fantasy. He sees himself as writing lots of different things. So that should play out, I think, into what these different um, uh, shows are when they appear and just as a sort of a final tweak um he did or i think it was you actually sort of talked about the john snow show um uh, <laughs> you've got in the the worst pun ever with your idea of i wonder who the <laughs> the, the, the snow runners are going to be on that one but um the but that is different to all of the other ones yes that, that is in the future in terms of Game of Thrones, the book, or song of, it's Game of Thrones, the TV show, or Song of Ice and Fire, the books, in that this isn't a matter of trying to make sure everything is kept right in the history. This is, well, who knows what happens next? You can, yeah. anything could happen after, after this. So um, that is a completely different uh, proposition. Um, yeah. I did have one question from one of my patrons, and there, but if you're in the chat, I want to come to if there are any sort of questions for Aziz, but perhaps we'll try and pick up one or two of them quickly that, that are in the chat. But one of my patrons, um, 144, uh, says, in the interview with History of Westeros, George R. R. Martin mentioned that he can't do a radio adaptation of A Song of Ice and Fire due to legal reasons. Uh, not sure how this works in the English-speaking word. Is this something like the Polish, and I've got a pronunciation guide here, Swuhowisko, uh, that's probably still pronounced incorrectly, I apologise, where the narrator is read by one reader and every other character's dialogue is read by a different voice actor. Um, and uh, she was saying that she prefers that. Is there, I mean, that was my interpretation, was that he he thinks that you can have a an, somebody reading the story for an audio book, but you can't do anything that starts to go over that line towards... A, a radio player, I think, was the way that he was sort of talking about. Yeah, it. that's that's how he introduced it because uh, radio serials or something I had listened to a bit when I was younger. A full production of Star Wars, for example, when I was like eight or nine, was on the radio and it had all the sound effects and everything. And I thought that would be a really good idea for a Song of Ice and Fire because it could be unabridged. And I love Roy Dotrice. Not everybody does, but overall, he's very successful or popular as a book reader. But we're not going to get a full seven books from him. The man has passed on, so there's just no chance of that. And it would be nice to have a complete audio of A Song of Ice and Fire read with one consistent production all the way through. But you're right. This is something that is we didn't have a lot of understanding of where the where the rights lay on that. And apparently George does not own those particular rights anymore. I don't think he even said in the interview who does. I think probably, it's probably HBO. But it might be hmm. it might be Random House because they're they have the audio. They're the ones who publish the audio book. So I'm not really sure about that. But it's definitely not owned by him. And as an aside, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to make it until the whole thing is done anyway, because then you run into the same problem I was just suggesting you would have, which is you would maybe not be able to finish it because if you start it now, when is the final book going to come out? You might have people who aren't available anymore or have passed on or something like that. So you want to wait till it's all done, but it would be fantastic to have all the voices and that, and that is becoming a thing more to, to again, use star Wars as an example, star Wars audiobooks are, there's a lot of full audio productions coming around in star Wars that they have voice acting, those familiar Star Wars sounds like the lightsabers and the blasters and the TIE fighters, which just really put you in that world. And we could have some of the same thing. If the same thing existed for A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, you'd have some of those familiar sounds, maybe the theme song, maybe the roar of a dragon. I don't know. <laughs> some, some examples like that. But uh, it does sound like if we're ever going to get something like that, it wouldn't be for a very long time. But I still have my fingers crossed. <laughs> But it is tricky, yeah. right? The, right, the yeah. right situation is really something that we 
even after interviewing him on it, it's still not entirely clear, but <laughs> it's a little clearer. <laughs> it is. I mean, I think at, at a very high level, without getting into details, it sounded to me like he said before that he sold off the TV rights to HBO, he'd sold off bits of rights to various other companies yeah, to do yeah. things. And he, I think he used the example of the the swords, the, the Valyrian steel swords as a manufacturer who makes them. Um, and there are a couple of other things that he's given them rights to do. And then HBO came in and they normally just buy all the rights. And he <laughs> went, well, man, you can't buy all of these because I've already sold some of them. So uh, so that seems to be the sort of the, as far as I can see it, the main breakdown. It's a lot less complicated than the Tolkien rights that genuinely even the people you think should know haven't got the foggiest idea of what's going yeah. on and who owns the rights for things. They sold a whole new load, a whole load of rights got sold um, just a couple of weeks ago and it seems important uh, but at the same time I don't really know what that means because this means hey there no. might be lots of new Lord of the Rings films but we already know that there is somebody who holds the rights to make Lord of the Rings films. Anyway, I'm That's not going confusing. down that. <laughs> yeah, not going down that road. Um, just a quick couple of quick things from the chat. Uh, Peter Nopic saying, "What was your favourite artwork at George R. R. Martin's house?" This, yeah, you know, this is quite fun because this is quite rare. Actually, we don't normally see him in 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 his own setting. So <laughs> that's but, yeah, a what, what tough one. His favorite art, it might've been the stained glass windows, which I know isn't one thing, but it's a set of things. As I said at the beginning, he has all the main houses that he's got a stained glass window. There's a, we saw a Baratheon one and a Stark one and a Lannister one. There's probably a few others that, that we didn't see, but a uh, single piece of artwork. Ooh, that is really tough. There were so many good ones. He had every Valyrian steel sword, all the ver show and book versions, probably just the miniature dioramas though. He has some really uh, fantastic ones. It might've been the one with the Viking ship with the giant Kraken coming out to, to grab it. And if you've, if you pull up the interview and fast forward to 5730, Ashea does a quick scroll around, or not scroll around, but pan around the room with the camera so you can get a shot of a lot of the different miniatures, dioramas, the displays that he has. Some of them are Lord of the Rings. There's one with the, the what's that big tower with the king pointing that's in the movie, in, in the, uh, the giant statues? Or the, the Argonaut pointing with the two kings, yeah, yeah, yeah. That he's got a miniature version of that <laughs> in there with this with the, the statues like this tall, but it's very recognizable. And then just a lot of other scenes from different things. He's got a fever dream, uh, steamboat that was given mm -hmm. to him as an award at, in like eight or ten years ago for so, at some convention, and they just yeah, it, I, it's hard to pick a favorite. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I'm struggling. I'm naming. I'm just going to, if I don't stop myself, I'll just name other cool things that were there <laughs> without ranking them. <laughs> no, I know it's entirely understood. But I see um, uh, Joe Magician is in the chat. Uh, there, hey, Kids, uh, he was on here last week. Um, we'll be uh, talking about a few things in a moment that uh, I'm sh I, yeah, I think you've made video. I haven't watched those videos yet, but um, a lot of the sort of the, follow on from that whole um Aegon's dream or whatever we're calling it these days uh, um, I yeah. know you got quite interested in that but we will definitely pick up on that one uh one other thing just in the chat I wanted to before we move on from George R. R. Martin I think it was Carl Karsnark there one of my fantastic moderators who said that George R. R. Martin's reaction and I'd like your take on this George R. R. Martin's reaction to um Fagon as a as a word was quite interesting now this was to, to sort of give the context of this that the, within the fandom we have lots of these kind of words and phrases that we know what they mean but they're not actually in the original work and and Shay, i think it was initially was like trying him out was he aware of all of these different things mm. and then one or other of you talked about fagon and what's what's your interpretation of how he responded there yeah you wonder what he's heard and what he hasn't because he's not on social media i mean he has he technically has a twitter account and a facebook page but those are run by minions of his that have full-time jobs outside of this so they're not even they don't pay a lot of attention to what's on there he gets tagged constantly on twitter and i, I don't know how they would keep up with that but he does it so he doesn't look at it at all so yeah he's not really super aware of that but yeah, he's he tries to stay away from some uh, outlets because 
there is issues with legal things and, and ideas and where they came from. So he's wary of, of that. But um, he did. Yeah, he had heard of Fagon and he thought it was he, he was a little bemused, I think, that people had decided he's uh, clearly if they're calling him that they think he's not Rhaegar's son, which he thinks that it's interesting that people have just made that decision and i i pointed out it's like well that's what Tyrion thinks so a lot of people are just following Tyrion's lead there <laughs> and he's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i think um i i really wonder what he thinks of some of those other ones we obviously didn't have time to just go through every single one but he had heard of the pink letter obviously that phrase doesn't appear in the books but we all know what that means the letter from maybe from Ramsey or Mance or whoever you think it was sent by that was sent to John at the Night's Watch. And <laughs> yeah, you, you wonder what he's heard and what, what, uh, what he thinks of these, these names. But I think, I think he just gets a kick out of it. The, the fandom nicknames for things, the shortened versions of stuff. He, he couldn't possibly predict that people would give these things nicknames or what they would be. So I feel like it's something that, that, gives him a, a smile because it's an unexpected result of his own creation, like the reactions to what he wrote. And he does like, he doesn't know how clear it is. Like he doesn't know what, when he writes it, he's, he thinks he's creating a mystery mm. and he's hope he's probably hoping for about an even split. Half people are going to think, He's a black fire. Half people are going to think he's Rhaegar. So that's probably what he's aiming for. I don't think that's actually what happened. I think, I don't know what percentage it is, but I, he has no way to predict that. So I'm sure he gets a kick out of seeing the result. It's like you do an experiment <laughs> and you see how many people believe Joffrey sent the dagger to kill with the cat's paw dagger to kill brand how many people think it was somebody else like these all these little questions within the series and i'm sure there's hundreds of these what ifs or who done it's that george is probably or things that aren't yet resolved that george is probably uh aiming for something that doesn't always come out the way he wants i mean the black he the blacks are, are in, in our corner of the fandom We'll see how it comes out in House of the Dragon, but from book readers, the blacks are a lot more popular than the greens. That doesn't mean the show will go out that way. And I don't know, if, and I don't think George intended it that way. I think George was hoping for more of a 50 50 split there, too. But that just goes to show you can't predict how the public will react, how people will take things. And of course, some of these things he wrote 20, 30 years ago. So the audience has changed, he's changed. So yeah, it's tricky, but yeah, it's neat yeah. to present him with these things. I, I get a kick out of seeing him get a kick out of it. Yeah. And and he he seemed generally speaking, he seemed in good form. I I thought he he looked well. He looked engaged. Um, uh, quite the raconteur there. Um, mm -hmm. sort of telling his stories. He so I I think that's good news that uh, he because he did have COVID uh, a few weeks ago at uh, Comic Con. Yeah. So uh, he's clearly fully recovered, and that's uh, excellent news. I think the only other thing I would pick up before we move on. Is I mean, and this came up in a few different places in slightly different ways. Um, almost, uh, I don't think he intended it this way, but almost a kind of like a slap on the wrist for the fandom to say, you know, don't overthink some of these things. Mm. Um, he, he talks about like magic, and it's just, you know, this is actually, um, I quite like there being a mystery. So there's no big uh, sort of integrated theory of how magic works in my world. This has to be a mystery. Um, uh, which kind of puts the, you know, uh, the, the the down on me doing my long, long promised how his how magic works in the Song of Ice and Fire video, um, yeah. and also uh, a video one of the collaborations we did, and this was uh, f from the the mind of Aziz himself. So um, uh, noticing the you even talked about it in the in the interview, noticing the similarities between one of his chapters and a chapter we have in the Lord of the Rings. And uh, George R. R. Martin's response was, yeah, "Really? Oh, okay. I suppose so." <laughs> <It was just laughs> yeah, like... that was so surprising. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he. I, I mean, it just goes to show that's a, a level of genius I hadn't expected. I mean, maybe some people wouldn't see it that way, but he just his mind is just so deep in these things that he doesn't he doesn't realize that they're coming from a, a place of influence and that doesn't, doesn't matter to him. It doesn't matter if it's, if he's accidentally creating an homage because that's a good thing. There's nothing, there's obviously nothing wrong with that. So, um, 
I, I definitely was expecting a different answer. I definitely was expecting like a little grin. It's like, I'm going to sneak an homage in here. He, 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 mustache twirl. And then hopefully people will notice it and he'll be pleased if people notice this. But yeah, but he said, nope, I, that was totally an accident. <laughs> but he, he's right. He says he reads Lord of the Rings once a year. So it makes sense that that would just be, you know, so embedded yeah. in there. And it's not like it was a major plot point. Like it reads like an, a series of homages. It's not like it, it, it isn't a, uh, a borrowing of the plot really these were just deep small little details uh so <laughs> yeah like wow the man's he just thinks in story all at all times and it's just a different way his brain works in ways that we can't fully conceive and i guess he probably can't either because he's only been in his head he's you know <laughs> he's, yeah. he hasn't been in anyone else's head either so um, so I think uh with that I'm gonna start start to wrap up the the George R. Martin interview uh, section. As I say, I think it cool. really is worth uh, having a look. If you've not watched it, it's it's worth an hour or so of your time. There's a link down in the description. Um, and uh, also, I should probably say, while we've been talking, this is a charity live stream. Um, all of my nice live streams will look be at charity that, live streams. <laughs> and people have been giving, um, and I haven't, I mean, people, the names have been going through. So thank you very much uh, for those who've been uh, donating while we've been going. We've... Um, we got about a thousand last time, um, and uh, we're already up to about a, another two hundred this time. So, uh, thank you very much if you if you have donated. It's hugely uh, generous of you, and, and I really do appreciate it. Um, but let's move on to uh, looking. We sort of look back first of all, episode one of House of the Dragon. Um, I think, I mean, I struggle to find anyone who actively hated it uh i would think i'd struggle to find many people within the fandom who disliked it even um it, it seems to have been almost universally loved um what's i mean I, I think for me the thing that i loved was the fact that they they took the story they were very close to the original that we have in the books but they, when they made changes, I understood why they made changes, and they made some decisions, and they were just, um, uh, just quite courageous in the way that they did that. And 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 everything so far has been inter interconnected and has been working and makes sense. They haven't just made some decisions that you know you go, well, why on earth did they do that? Um, but what's your what's your initial take on episode one? Very similar to yours. I was very pleased. I thought they captured the feel of the original show very well with their filming techniques and the, the way they made all the sets look. But it was, you could tell it was souped up a bit. They had a little more money, the, like comparing the tournament to the episode three tournament that happened in season one. I forget, maybe that's episode two, but similar, you know what I'm talking about. The jousting, this, the filming was higher quality. They had more money, more budget, and you could tell. And also it's been 10 years and techniques have improved on that sort of thing. So it's just all a bunch of improvements across the board. But like you said, it's, it's a really unusual bit of source material. I actually kind of wonder if you might see more of this in Hollywood where there's the source material is a little more open-ended rather than a script mm. with specific dialogue. I wonder if this will catch on because it, it's, it's working really well. I mean, part of that is because it's attached this big project, uh, this big name art. It's, it's a game of Thrones thing. And that's had a lot of groundwork behind it, but the actors have all responded to it really well in terms of like the way they prepared for their roles and having a little flexibility and, it uh, gives them gives them a little uh, freedom to work out a few of the character details. Obviously, they can't just go off and make all these decisions on their own. There has to be some consistency, some central planning. But small details, it's just more brains working on these issues, more people who are very invested in what's going on, making decisions and having an input. It's very different than Game of Thrones in that there were a far fewer minds in charge. This is a team. This time around, yes, there's two showrunners just in both cases, but the the first set of showrunners had a much smaller group of writers and thinkers, and this group is bigger and wider and more diverse in terms of its experiences in, in the industry and in life. And that's important for writing believable characters is having a wide ver array of experiences from the writers to draw off on. And I think that really reflects in the material you've got subtle literary themes you've got strong central themes that are easy to to glom onto you've got 
excellent acting. The casting has proven to be superb given the way these actors have delivered. I thought Sean Brooke was unbelievable as Emma. Millie Alcock mm -hmm. was just home run after home run. Uh, Matt Smith, Patty Considine, just some of these characters we've hardly even begun to see. I mean, Carlos Velarian was, was strong, but he's just getting started. Uh, he hasn't really been featured yet. Probably will be soon. <laughs> Same with Rainies and all these other characters. Eve Bass just... I, I'm, I could just go on and on about how much I loved it. So, but the numbers speak for themselves, right, Robert? The, our individual opinions are are great, but the fact is that it's how well it does out there is what really matters in terms of getting more stories like this and 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 encouraging them to follow this pattern. It's like, hey, you did it well. Well, we'll keep doing it this way, you know. <laughs> So that yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think you, you talked a bit about some of the, the themes that were coming through. And there were a couple of things that um, just sort of like, uh, I wouldn't say they caught me by surprise, but it's like, oh, OK, I see what you're doing there. Like, uh, for example, the, the characterization we have of Damon Targaryen is very Valyrian um, yeah. in a way that um, the character comes across as, as being quite Targaryen in the book. But then here we first meet him. He's talking in high Valyrian. He's got this Valyrian steel uh, necklace that he's giving over to to his niece. Um, he's being set up as being the, you know this very Targaryen character, which I think works really well. And it, it wouldn't surprise me if they kind of start playing up this idea of of the Targaryen nature versus the kind of the faith of the seven kind of nature of the mm. high towers against the, yeah. uh, the Targaryens as a sort of a showing the different sides of this. And also a few little things like the, the, the cuts from the iron throne. I'm convinced no inside information on this, but I'm convinced this has going to be leading up to something. Um, the yeah. twice in that, first episode we get Viserys having a cut from the Iron Throne I'm going to do a video on, on this because I think this is George R. R. Martin has lots of hints about what being cut by the Iron Throne symbolically might mean um, and I think it wasn't a coincidence that it was when the house um, kind of like split when he cast out his brother that's the point at which he got cut by the yes. Iron Throne um, well said. And I do wonder, as I say, this is just random speculation. I do wonder whether we know, uh, and I should say the approach to spoilers on this is, uh, if it's in the books, then it's fair game. I'm not going to do show spoilers for this at all. I know that uh, some people have seen the leaked version. I, I actually got, I, I've seen episode two, but I'm not going to give any show spoilers for this at all. Um, but I think that um, it would not surprise me if we get up to the point that where Viserys dies and the reason for his death is actually these cuts, which we know mm. they keep on festering. Um, maybe that just keeps on getting worse. I agree. Yeah. I mean, in the books, he loses two fingers later and, and Melos, they don't like how Melos is treating him, which is already something we've seen, which is a great example of them bringing over subtle details from fire and blood and using them very effectively, having Melos be maybe not a great healer. There's, Maybe it's worse than that. Maybe there's a conspiracy or something, but maybe he's just bad at healing. <laughs> That's another, it's yeah. any, any rain, anywhere between those possibilities. And it could be both. He could be a bad healer who's also engaging in conspiracy theories or conspiracies. Uh, so, but one thing I that it was really surprising, not just the detail of, Aegon's dream. Of course, that's been a really fun revelation. It's set the fandom afire, both show and book fandom. And that was a real surprise. Not just that specific plot point, but the fact that they found a way in the first episode to fire up all the existing show fans and the existing book fans. I just got to hand it to them for the cleverness of that writing and saying, as a showrunner, you want to get the book fans excited. We're the ones that are obsessed 24 seven. You got to have the numbers. They got to have the yeah. show fans. They got to have those 20 million viewers or whatever that number is. That's determines a big part of their success, but you know, firing up the book fans is a really big deal too, because we're, we're louder. You know, <laughs> each one of us is, is five or 10 regular fans worth of talking or, or engagement. So, so we matter in a, in a, in our own way as well. And so they've very cleverly, 
fired both major groups up and then a lot of subgroups within like fans of prophecy fans of dragons of course the dragon fans knew they were going to get a lot but you know so yeah just very well done just great thinking great planning great attention to detail and heck this is only one episode i've only seen one i haven't seen the second one yet you have but i'm saying all this after one episode so <laughs> well, yeah uh so i mean I, as a nice point i enjoyed episode two that's as far as i'm gonna go in terms of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of a review so um yeah that's uh i don't 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 be worried about it it's uh it, it keeps up the standard um let's go to um question from one of my patrons as always i try to uh, shape these live streams around questions from my patrons. Uh, patrons, this is just one of my ways of thanking you. I can't do what I do without your support. So, so thank you very much. I do always try and prioritize questions from you. Um, Robbie Meeson saying, hey, Robert, who do you think Alicent's mother is? Thank you for all you do. Now, this is a this is one of those things that it it was played up more on the show than uh in the book um th this idea that Alison had lost her mother and things like that um i think the short answer the technical answer is we do not know who Alison's mother is that that's not revealed anywhere we don't have a name anywhere um but aziz have you got any sort of speculation i know there are some uh I don't know, tinfoil theories out there, perhaps we can say about who her mother is. Do you do you think this is anyone important or do you do you have any speculation on who it might be? I don't. And I think one of the clues that it's not a huge plot point is that Emily Carey, the actress playing young Allison, was allowed to think up some details for her mother. That's something she said in an interview. So if they had big plans for that character, I'm not sure they would have allowed the actress to to run with it like that. So, cause a Emily did something really interesting, which is that she journaled in character. She blogged in oh, wow. character, which I thought was a great idea, just a way to get in character and stay in character and really explore what this character would be thinking about and what be on their mind. And of course, if you're doing that, if you're going through that exercise, you're Alison Hightower. Of course, one of the things you're going to have to think through is your mother, because as you say, she apparently lost her mother somewhat recently. So of course it's going to be on her mind. And that's, and it's, it's easy to miss that she lost her mother. We don't know how, probably not childbirth, but it could have been. So that would have been something that was affecting her as well. And that's, that's reflected when she goes to, to talk to Viserys and says, when I lost my mother, I just wanted people to say, I'm sorry for your loss or something like that. They just wanted her to be, she just wanted to be treated like a human. So I think that is, yeah, I don't know that there's any important in terms of she infects like intrigue or her bloodline was super important. But as a character, it's she's still very important because she's a mother and a wife to characters who were very much central mm. and her loss is affecting them even though we don't know a lot about them. So it makes sense for someone like Emily to, to come up with more detail, to have something tangible to for her character to be sad about. It's like this is vague, my mother died. Of course, you know that's sad, but it's a lot more real. It's a lot more tangible if she adds some detail to that. So yeah, um, kind of ties back to your earlier point about how this show has some different things going on with the way the script and, and actors are, are working with it. Um, yeah, and I think in terms of the speculation on who this might be, I think I would agree. This is this isn't a big plot point, and I think that probably gives us a a, a hint that what we're looking at is not um, a Lannister or a Baratheon or something like that, because that would have been mentioned at some point in the book. That yeah, Alison to say, hey, my my mother's family will come and help us out here or something. Like that. that never happens. So. Uh, the, it's, the implication is that this isn't one of the the big houses. It's probably uh, a significant house in the Reach. Would probably would my yeah. my guess. Um, one of their vassals, maybe, or exactly. So it's not um, uh, Otto Hightower. Isn't the Lord? He's not Lord Hightower. Um, so right. it's not that they're going to be looking for how do we build this huge alliance for sort of the the future generations of House Hightower. He's there. He will have. It's the equivalent of the Ned Stark when he didn't think he was going to inherit. 
who do you think actually is a realistic option there? It's not one of the big houses, it's the next rung down. Yeah. So, I mean, someone like, probably not, but someone like House Rowan or, I mean, uh, maybe Charlie, I don't know, that that kind of level yeah. we're, we're talking about, I think. It could be like a Tyrell. The Tyrell sit out the dance because they have mm. a boy, an infant lord, but that would explain how it could be a major house that still isn't involved because we already know they're not involved. But yeah, but I, I would guess that that's the biggest house it could possibly be. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think that's it. The, 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 the key point here is this isn't going to be a big plot point. Um, so the implication is this is um, not a, not a hugely important house and it's not a hugely important detail, but um, probably something in the reach um, but uh, sort of a, a quite a fun question, I think, from the, the Brandalorian uh, saying, hey, Robert and chat, you have to be roommates with uh, for a year with either Damon Targaryen or Otto Hightower. Who do you <laughs> choose? Uh, sure, Damon might be a bit crazy, but Otto has the personality of a cabbage. Well, I mean, I, I gave this more thought than I probably should have done. And I decided that I I wouldn't actually wish to be roommates with Damon Targaryen. Um, uh, because he's just a little bit too crazy for me. I, I'm not sure whether I'd survive the year. Uh, so I would probably be roommates with with, uh, with Otto. He, he seems, yes, he might be a bit dull. Yes, he might be a bit um, manipulative, shall we say. Um, but I suspect he would always take his turn doing the dishes. and, and, and <laughs> So um, I could always uh. nip out for a night carousing on the town with Damon um, and then sort of sneak in late at night and hope Otto didn't notice. Um, but well, what was your, what's your take, Aziz? I might go the other way. I think I agree that Otto might be, the boring might be good, but he also strikes me as very haughty. He might expect me to do all the dishes. And I'm not, you know, <laughs> Damon wouldn't necessarily be any different, but he might, um, oh, Damon would at least, yeah, he would be, what, how old am I in this? Am I in college? Because if it's college, definitely Damon, but... <laughs> <laughs> true, yeah. But I'm not in college. If we're talking about right now, yeah, I guess I guess Otto. It's tough, but maybe Damon. I, I'm tempted to say Damon because he might be more fun. If he's, I'm not in his way. I, I'm not in his path to the throne, so he might not. Uh, I'm not his. I'm not a problem for him. So maybe, yeah. But maybe just one day I wake up and you know a bunch of my stuff is smashed because he invited the gold cloaks over and they just those guys can't be trusted in a to 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 be cautious around my stuff <laughs> they'd just be tromps traipsing around breaking things yeah i don't know that's a very tough question maybe i'll just I say think, i'll, I'll think... say damon because you said auto I'll, I'll make okay, well driver. that's that's fair i mean i think <laughs> damon obviously has his own pet dragon which probably isn't great for uh uh keeping your things uh not aflame mm, that's a good um <laughs> Let's go with a question. Uh, thanks for that, the Brandalorian. Let's go with the question. Uh, this is about Aegon's prophecy, which I, I think was the thing that most of us were talking about after this episode. Catherine Furseth saying um, that Aziz, so quoting you, Aziz said on History of Westeros stream that if Aegon had told anyone, they would think that he was crazy. And that's possibly true. But the North remembers, or so they say, and the stories or legends of the others in the Long Night are very much alive in the North. So if Aegon had told of his dream to the Lord of Winterfell, would there be a chance they would have taken notice? Um, and just to sort of a, a little bit more lead in on that, this was something... Uh, I, I don't know whether he's still in the chat, Matt, but um, when Joe Magician was on last week, I'd... I gave my sort of my standard thought about uh, or, or concern bit the, the 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 story that hasn't yet worked worked for me, which was that if Aegon had invaded with this idea of saving against the White Walker invasion, why on earth did it take him uh, three decades to go up to Winterfell? We'd never even read of him going up to the Wall uh, to investigate uh, what's going on up there, um, but. Why did it take so long? And Matt came up with this idea that this was um, that perhaps they had a meeting when Torren, uh, Stark, and uh, Aegon the Conqueror met, and Torren became the king who knelt. Maybe. 
they just had a meeting of minds and Aegon said, hey, I've got this prophecy that we need to care about the North. And then Turon said, hey, we've also got all of these kind of histories and legends about the North. Let's just be partners in this. And so the the question, so Catherine was saying, and I've no idea the context of this, that you you said you thought Aegon would probably be laughed at if he if he talked about the prophecy. Do you think that's do you think that's right? I think he, in most circles, I think Caroline or Catherine is right that uh, it's not a universal thing. They wouldn't all laugh at him or call him a blasphemer. I think worshippers of the seven would, but I definitely think the North is a different ball game, a different reaction because they don't worship the seven. So they would see it differently. And, and that's just without Aegon understanding the big picture. Once we include the knowledge that there must always be a Stark in Winterfell, there must always there must be a Targaryen on the Iron Throne. These are like the same concepts, but for mm -hmm. different houses. And if we take the general idea that the others are coming, it's an event in the future that is can be detected by a variety of prophetic magics. Can be detected. The future can be seen through a multitude of fire magic, ice magic, where whatever you want to call it. These are just generic terms I'm throwing out there to categorize the forms of magic that exist in this world. Don't take those too literally. But we recognize there's different forms of magic, whether it's red priests, whether it's draconic stuff, blood magic, glass candles, or stuff from the Weirwood Network. There's lots of stuff here. So different people have predicted the others. Obviously, Aegon the Conqueror is not the only one who figured it out. So if Aegon presented this to Torin, I think Torin's a good chance is someone that wouldn't laugh at him. In fact, Aegon, that might be why he would tell him. I think that it's really important that Aegon can't just go around saying, I believe in these prophecies, as he's simultaneously trying to adopt the faith of the seven and saying, hey, I worship the same gods you all do. But also, I believe in this prophecy that has nothing to do with the faith of the seven that yeah. I think the High Septon would be like, stop that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it, it contradicts his goal to talk about it. The Northerners might be an exception, though, because they don't fo follow those gods and because they might already be aware of this prophecy through their own methods and means or through they might not even know what it means that a stark must always be in winterfell but it might be but they clearly take it seriously even ned stark says yeah we got to leave rob here i'm going south but rob's got to stay here because we got to have a stark in winterfell brand's staying behind as well so benjen didn't take the black until ned returned from the war that they, they've been following this precept for a long time and we don't exactly know why but it, it stands to reason that it could tie into that so yeah I, so, so going back to the original question yeah i think there there was a lot of issue with Aegon just announcing this to the world but there were definitely some people he could tell um and i think the northerners are among that group potentially because of their lack but of on seven the show, certainly the, the impression seems to be that um this is something that the king passes down to the heir um yeah. not lots of other people even in their own family as far as we we can tell um that's the way that uh certainly we got framed by viserys talking to rainier is that now now yeah. you're the heir i'm going to tell you and the implication i don't think we've we've found out yet but the implication is that presumably damon also knew it if he was the heir for this period of time um i, I don't I'm, know maybe yeah. I, i'm not sure he knew because he when he tells rainier uh he's like i never damon never had was never the like, stuff of kings he's never seen his brother as someone that would that could be his heir in the long term um so yeah but i think that's a plot point i think that will come up i think mm. there's probably going to be clarification on who knew whether it's literally just king to heir which i kind of doubt that it's just king to heir because like does that that would mean that visenya didn't know like Aegon had the dream and didn't tell either of his sisters which i kind of doubt that and then it then also it gets really tricky. The how did it get to Jaehaerys if Megor usurped Jaehaerys' brother and didn't have any kids of his own? So how did it then get to Jaehaerys if if his family had been killed off? So I suspect more people knew, um, and whether or not Damon knew, I suspect we'll find that out one way or another um, because of future events that we know from Fire and Blood are going to bring Rainier and Damon and have reason to communicate about things in the future. So. <laughs> yeah i mean my, my take just on that because i was also thinking about this uh how did it get down to viserys uh i mean my take is yes 
Aegon, as you say, he almost certainly told his sister wives. They did rule almost as the three of them. Yes, Aegon was technically the king, but uh, they sat on the Iron Throne when he wasn't there and they ruled effectively. So um, I think he probably will have shared it. Uh, then Visenya will almost certainly have shared it, I think, with Maegor. Yeah, um, I agree. I he, agree. He was then going off to become king. And then we do have this fantastic character, area who we all know from i mean there is a sort of like a, a twin swap thing going on there but let's ignore that for one moment um they we all know her from that bit in fire and blood when she gets onto valerian and heads off but uh and then comes back much later and it's all quite horror and gruesome but she was technically the heir twice for both anus and then magor so Almost certainly she would have known if this idea of handing it down to the heir is true. And she did survive into Jaehaerys's reign. So the mm. the missing bit here, I would say, is that, well, if she knows and then Jaehaerys becomes king, all we need is for her to tell Jaehaerys and say, OK, I accept I'm never going to be the ruling monarch here, but this is important enough that you need to know. Yeah. I am fascinated by this. One thing that's so neat is that I sort of referenced this before, but it's causing us to rethink the, the actions of every single Targaryen monarch and a few others and that were close to the top as well, which is great. <laughs> it's so much fun. We have we get to look at every winter again and say, how did the Targaryens react to uh, winters of unusual length and think oh is this is this it <laughs> and yeah. we also have to it also causes us to relook back at other targaryen prophecy because we know that they are they're so serious about this and the setup is there we have danis the dreamer who's the reason the targaryens didn't get destroyed by the doom so of course they would take dreams very seriously and we have to wonder as well about how this the irony of how it didn't get past to Daenerys, but she yeah. found out anyway. She dreamt of Rhaegar, she saw it in the House of the Undying, and that brings us into glass candle territory where someone like Quaith is maybe making sure she knows. Um, I re I went back and looked at Clash of Kings, and when she has her Jesus coming out of the desert moment with the three wise men or two wise men and one wise woman <laughs> meet her out as she's approaching Karth and tell her all about the wonders of the city. The two men are both interested in getting things out of her. Zaro and uh, Pyat Pri. They have an agenda. Quaith doesn't seem to want anything from her. He just she just tells her things and informs her and gives her information and then continues to pop up in her dreams. It's almost like Quaith knows about the prophecy and that's her motive is to make sure the world doesn't end to make sure this prophecy gets fulfilled, which makes sense. A, a, a random character giving help to a central character for no reason. That's just RPG nonsense. <laughs> this character needs motivation. <laughs> It's like an NPC. Helpful NPCs don't exist in George R. R. Martin's story. You need a, a compelling reason for this character to tell Daenerys all these prophetic details and, and obscure uh, facts there. So this gives Quaith motivation that we have only been able to speculate about before. Now it gives us a little more concrete on characters like her. So and that's just one character. And she's not a Targaryen, probably. Uh, well, <laughs> you, you say that. Maybe, so this, maybe. She could be. She could be. <laughs> my, uh, I, I will, I will very quickly run, run my run my Quaith theory past you. Because coming back to it, this now makes perhaps even more sense. Which is, that's so my, my theory is that this is Shira Seastar. Now, for those who do not know... Shira Seastar is one of what, the, the, the great bastards of this Aegon IV's bastard children, and they were you know, a pretty impressive bunch, it has to be said. Um, Blood Raven was one of them, uh, she was another one of them. And um, she kind of disappears from the narrative at some point. We don't really know what happened to her. We do know that she was close with Blood Raven. Uh, we do know that she allegedly was uh, a sorceress of some kind. She was involved in magic in some. So it makes sense to me that perhaps she went away to learn more magic. Where might you go and learn more magic? A shy. So that, that kind of mm -hmm. works for me as a as a potential. Um, 
then, as you say, the thing about Quaith is that she's she's there with two clear ish, I think, objectives in ish, what she yeah. said. <laughs> uh, the first is don't trust anybody else. It's just trust you. She reels off this whole list of these, the don't trust the perfume seneschal, don't trust this person, don't trust that person. And it's like all of these people that, you know, they're not on your side. As if to say, you're the one. You have to just go with your own instincts. And then the second one is this repeated refrain, uh, remember who you are, Daenerys. The dragons remember, do you? And that feels very targaryen -y. Wanting her to be like a Targaryen and the the bit that always appealed to me was this uh, symmetry between we've got Blood Raven and Shira Seastar who we know that they were close we I'm sure they talked about these kinds of things let's say they had this I some sort of concept of the prince that was promised or this prophecy or something and now, as symmetry, we've got this potential situation where Blood Raven has decided he thinks he knows who this is. He's got a champion. This is Jon Snow. He's 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 developing him. He's giving him the tools. Literally, he's giving him the dragon glass. He's giving him dreams. Uh, he's working with him. Uh, what if Shira Sea Star is on the other continent? She's also got her champion. She thinks she knows who this person is. She thinks this is Daenerys. And at some point, the two of them are going to connect in that works for me and i think it works at an extra level if you think that they are both working with this idea of of, of aegon's prophecy that the targaryens there must be a targaryen on the throne i like it you know there's uh it's definitely possible that i, I agree with you the shiera sea star is uh quaith has been around a bit it's got some uh, you know it doesn't have completely solid evidence, but it fits. Given what we know now, it works. There's nothing you could strongly say that eliminates that theory. The only, the only maybe, uh, the biggest clue for me is maybe Danny doesn't notice the mismatched eyes that she has, that maybe that would have been something she would have seen, but that's no, that's, that's not a strong enough thing to cancel the theory. Uh, but this is also really interesting because it gets into the idea of what exactly did Aegon dream and how mm -hmm. accurately did he interpret it and how accurately did he pass it down? because we have uh, one of the biggest ongoing recurring features of A Song of Ice and Fire with regards to prophecy is that they are generally mis misunderstood, almost always. I mean, there's maybe not a single example where someone just nailed it completely. Maybe the, maybe the ghost of High Heart nailed a few of her predictions exactly, but even those were in metaphor. Uh, those were only obvious in retrospect after they happened. It was like, oh yeah, the, the purple serpents in her hair. Yeah, okay, that's Sansa and the hairnet. You know, these things weren't clear initially. So, what, yeah, what does that mean? What does it mean when Aegon says, the Targaryen has to sit the Iron Throne? Uh, something that Ashea and I over at History of Westeros have talked about quite a lot over the last few years is we weren't big on Aegon being a dreamer. That theory has been around a while. We, we never really were for or against it, but we were very much for the idea of Azor Ahai being a uniter, a uniting mm -hmm. figure, not a warrior, not a fighter necessarily. The sword of heroes is probably metaphorical and... Danny is united the Dothraki, the Unsullied, Giscari, Miranese, all these different races, probably more to come, probably more like, especially because she's a freer of slaves and these slaves come from a huge group of nations. So she's uniting all these people to fight against the darkness. Jon Snow is doing a very similar thing, uniting free folk, kingsmen, northerners, and the free folk are already a widely disparate group. There's already hundreds of subcultures in there so that's already a bit of unity even within itself so john is doing this as well so we have these you're right you have these champions who are fulfilling the central goal of an azora high reborn figure uniting disparate peoples to bring them together to fight some great enemy that's where i think Aegon may have gotten it wrong Aegon interpreted unity and he heard the word unity or, or visualized it in his dream and thought conquest was necessary. That's where I'm like, I don't know that Aegon was right about the conquest being necessary. Bringing people together, conquering them isn't the only way to bring them together. Maybe in a kingdom scenario, that's it's an easy enough way to look at it and say, okay, well, 
that's unity sort of and but fast forward to the tv show was the realm united when the others were defeated no it was not <laughs> definitively not cersei was still running around euron was still running around there was a fight at king's landing while they're fighting in the north <laughs> so definitively no it was not a united realm dorn was not united dorn was not on the, you know like none of the half the realm was not following danny and john so in show canon and it may be book canon too when we get around to it we're, i think we're going to see that aegon was wrong about some things and the difference between conquest and unity forced unity versus getting people getting gaining consensus through a more i don't know maybe democratic's not the right term but saying hey we all need to pitch in and do this is it's a different thing right forcing people to to do it versus getting people getting buy-in and willing participation is entirely different so i think there's a lot of room in there for interpretation and that's why i think some people are looking at it like oh Aegon was justified or all these other targets are just nah, that's not really how george has been operating with prophecy has it robert he hasn't really he doesn't really show it that clearly, does he? He's, I mean, this is the thing I, I always say on these live streams is that he is more interested in people's reaction to prophecy than the truth of the prophecy itself. That's, that's very that, eloquent. Yeah. That's what, what drives so much of this. Just very quickly, Andrew Kay, I saw in the chat saying, Quaith also has some star imagery, mask of starlight, whispers of stars, uh, stars around her hands. So, yeah, the Shira Sea Star. Uh, maybe if you're going down that route, a little bit more evidence. True, um, true. <clears throat> but the this idea of prophecy and getting stuff wrong, we got focused in, understandably, on this second prophecy. But it is the second prophecy we had in the show, just yeah. in this one episode. We had this one that that he comes up, Viserys, um, and he sort of says, you know, I had this dream really clear as anything mm -hmm. and clearly this wasn't the first time because like his wife it doesn't go you had a what you had a <laughs> um it's like clearly he's done this before but this one um was misinterpreted um whichever way around we go with this we can probably try and say okay so yeah there are some elements here we we can say the the thundering of the hooves and the splintering of um shields or whatever it was that seems to be maybe the tawny that that was going on but the his clear uh, idea that this was going to be the son was going to be born just then and, and he was going to put this son on the uh the iron throne that was clearly a misinterpretation now yeah i i do wonder i'd love your thoughts on this because i do wonder the extent to which this was the showrunners just introducing the idea of prophecy and that, that Viserys had dreams um, or are they trying to do some kind of foreshadowing of this idea that that people misinterpret dreams and so we shouldn't really trust them is this uh, is this going somewhere else is he going to have another dream uh, so that's the kind of I, because we almost skated over it but he got a dream wrong somewhere along the line yeah I think this is the dream of his next son, he didn't think he was going to get remarried and have another child, but the details seem to line up better for Aegon II, which is he's going to be crowned with Aegon's crown. He's yeah. going to, there's definitely going to be the dragons roaring all at once, or maybe dancing all at once would be a more apt metaphor for, for book readers. Um, but splintering shields and thundering hoofs, that's just the outbreak of war, I think. Um, and the dragons roaring as once, that's, that's, that's war breaking out. So... Yeah, I, I love your idea that there will be more dreams from him. And I wonder what version or context they will have, what plot points they will reinforce, what conflict they'll increase. Because that's usually what they are used as a story devices, as a way to drive the action and to increase the conflict. They're very effective at that. So I, I, I would think that maybe they'll do it another time or two, especially given there's so many more children to be born. We're going to have a lot more kids born the rest of the season. So... Plenty more room for prophecy or guessing maybe this child is a special one or yeah. I mean, it, it's going to color so many things because Viserys is going to be, we know in, in the books that Viserys looks at Jace who is, doesn't look Targaryen, but does have a dragon as mm. he says, you're going to sit this throne someday. And so he looks at him as the heir and 
maybe we're going to have Jace get told the secret as well. It might, in fact, be that voiceover, the very beginning of episode one, that's Rain older Rhaenyra. That's Emily D'Arcy, or Emma D'Arcy's voice uh, as older Rhaenyra. That best idea I've heard for that is she's telling Jace. Mm. <laughs> she's telling this story to her son, who missed a lot of this. At the, you know, because he wouldn't, he wasn't obviously wasn't born yet for any of that. So it could be very close to the end of the season. It could be right before he takes off for the north, right? That would be a good time for it. Yeah, and that would link potentially around yeah to the end of the season. So we we kind of bracket with these yeah. kind of things. Um, yeah, that yeah. would that, that would work quite well. Um, just sort of following up uh, with Catherine Furseth, uh, sort of the second part of her question about this. Sure. Uh, saying that the legend of the Long Night seems to be known in the south of Westeros, at least among the educated elite, Tyrion, the Maesters, etc. And in cultures in Essos, there are different stories of the Long Night, meaning Aegon, as this is Aegon the Conqueror, as an educated former Valyrian, should be aware of these. Do you think that he made a connection between these legends and his prophecy? Um, which is interesting because uh, that we don't know because we haven't been introduced to this character. And this is where the, uh, the, the fun bit comes in. What you were saying is that we haven't, we haven't seen this. If this was a dream, we we didn't see it, nor did we see his interpretation of it. If he's sort of written this down, if the precise words are being passed on down, this is their interpretation. What is it? But do you think that um, they specifically will have made this connection across? Because this is still very much a kind of like a, the language used was quite, long night and the, the kind of thing you wouldn't you you could almost hear a stark say some about it something like you know when the, yeah. the winds come <laughs> howling out of the north and things like that it, it felt very westerosi do you think they will have made the connection across to all of those soz uh legends well i i think if they do a show on egg on the conquer if they ever develop this character and his sisters and all that they will have him do research they will have him maybe check out some text maybe look if anyone else has had this dream that would be a really good way to explore this theme and it's probably one of the reasons george left egg on the conqueror so unknown he is mm. listed by the sources of his own time as a bit of an enigma he was a very private person he only had a couple of friends he had oris baratheon was probably his only friend besides his sisters and that leaves a lot of room for him to have been keeping this stuff secret like that's why he was an enigma he was con he was trying to figure this stuff out he was very serious maybe a bit like rhaegar in a way that was rhaegar didn't have a lot of joy in him he was kind of sad and and filled with doom because he believed in this stuff very sincerely so if Aegon seems to have believed in it pretty sincerely as well for reasons we've outlined already that his family has a history of accurate dreams so I would think he wouldn't just take the dream and, and not do further research I think he would look into it more and maybe try to find other backing for it and that would only lead to him being more sure of it because if he, if he was to look into the histories if he was to leverage the the writings in the citadel or whatever his family had look at his own great 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 grandmother Danis the dreamers signs and portents book which probably was still around at that era it probably hadn't been lost yet we know mm -hmm. now it's been lost or seemingly lost but only a couple generations after Danis wrote it it was probably still at dragonstone i doubt they lost it that quickly so he would have been looking for corroboration i would think and, and if he looked hard enough he would have found it and that would have only increased his certainty that he was that his dream was true and that he needed to act on it again that takes us to his interpretation of everything in his dream and what what he got right and what he didn't but i i can only think that the more he reads the more he looks around the more he's gonna think this is real i'm not the only one to have seen this mm. given that i take it even more seriously uh, he may not have needed that i mean he may have this targaryen Targaryen's thinking their the main character in their own story is probably uh, a thing that happens a lot there. They don't seem like people with small egos and having a dragon and lots of power would probably pump your ego up a bit, to be fair. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah. That, that doesn't mean he didn't look for corroborating evidence elsewhere and, or it did it, or he, that he did just encounter it. He may not have been looking and it may have found him. Like if he told like, like in our example of talking to Torrin Stark, if he brought it up there and they're like, Oh, that actually aligns with some things we've heard as well, or some ancient legends that we've got written down in, in the Winterfell library or what have you, or in the libraries of Castle Black. So yeah, if George wants to go that route, he could easily, it's, it's there. I mean, or he's already wanted to go that route. It's been there because yeah, he's, he's, yeah. All sorts of rumors and this does add in, I think you, you mentioned this idea of maybe this is Jace at some point, the, you know, the voiceover at the beginning is this is Jace being told about all of this. Now, if he is, he, if he has been told about all of these prophecies, um, he presumably in season two, later in the book, will head north to Winterfell. And we know he really gets on uh, there with the Starks in different ways. Um, and uh, the, the the link does appear to be there if they wish to make it. And the, these showrunners seem to like doing this kind of thing from the limited amount of evidence we've got so far. They might want to link that in with this prophecy. Um, there are... I mean, a lot of these are mushroom stories in Fire and Blood, but there, there are stories about um, him marrying in uh, into the Stark family and things like that. So um, if they want to go down that route, they definitely can, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also very interesting that the Starks and Targaryens never had a, a full marriage. There were promises of that. There was an arrangement for that. And back in the day, we thought there was. Back in the day, there was an interesting theory running around because when... Uh, before it was clarified, the line from uh, Great John Umber is, it was the dragons we married, you know, not, and the dragons are all dead. That was his line right before they crowned Rob. So people are like, who married them? Hmm, was it the Starks? The Northern Stark married? What was that? What's that about, Great John? Mm -hmm. yeah, but of course, that didn't come, that didn't, co did not come to pass. But George may have been considering uh, something like that for his, the character that became Blood Raven, he may have had ideas to use someone else that in that in that regard earlier on, or yeah, who knows? But yeah, it's fair that he does he does change his mind a lot while writing, um, and I, that's increasingly becoming obvious. When he says he's a gardener writer, he does actually mean it. He does <laughs> yeah. uh, come up with things uh, uh, all the time. And Marvin Martin in the chat just saying, if you can't trust dreams and prophecies, why give them any thought at all? If it's fate. It don't matter what you do. I mean, this is a purely logical uh, uh, position, and I think that that's probably what you could say to any of these characters in A Song of Ice and Fire. But the moment that they have a prophecy that they think it about them, I think it's very human for them to be responding to it. And and we see this all over the place. We see uh, Cersei with with Maggie the Frog's prophecies. This impacts on her when she she's going crazy thinking about you know um, who's this person who's going to be bringing me down? Who's this person who's going to be the Valonqar? This is what drives a lot of what she's about. Similarly, Melisandre clearly has got her own views on. Um, uh, the fulfillment of prophecy, and that is driving that a whole part of that plot is based on who Melisandre thinks is Azora High Reborn, and you know, I think she's wrong, but that doesn't really matter. It's uh, the, the <laughs> important point is that this is yeah. her uh, pushing things forward because she is so obsessed with this. Um, uh, let's just as we're like uh, a little way, way into the, this uh, stream, let me just do two things. Uh, firstly, let me remind you this is a charity live stream. If you if you can afford it, um, if if you would like to, then uh, please do be generous. This is all in aid of Alzheimer's care and research, so it's a really worthwhile um, uh, charity. Um, We've made on this live stream, hang on, let me just double check where we're up to at the moment. Yeah, we've raised over $300 on this live stream alone to add to the $1,000 we came into this with. Uh, so if we can push that one up a little bit more uh, by the end, then I would be hugely grateful. If you're if you're appreciating this, uh, that, that's the way I would love you to be able to show your appreciation. Um, yeah, let's get it to 500. Let's do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's try and do it. Let's try and get it to there. Um, 
And the second thing is moderators. Thank you. I have got the finest set of moderators in the entire world mm. who do an amazing uh, bit of work. I saw there, there were some of Little Fingers bots were out earlier as well. They were stamping down on them. Uh, so uh, they also make it a very welcoming place. If you are watching live uh, and if you're in the chat um, and you're having fun, that's because the moderators are doing an amazing work. So please just uh, spend a moment in the chat and show them a little bit of love. Um, right, uh, with that, let's go to um, uh, another question. Um, we get a lot of dragon lore, I suspect, in this TV show. <laughs> Creative Branches says, could you put us through the tactics of rearing and hatching a dragon egg as a dragon might do it and as a Valyrian dragon rider does? And could you go into detail about what complications have arisen in the past and what resulted? Um, this is a really interesting question because we, we're seeing these dragon eggs now uh, as, as, as real things, that they're there. This isn't just some sort of theoretical idea of like, oh, a, a dragon egg, and then suddenly Daenerys hatches some. Uh, but that's, George R. R. Martin was very clear, that was a one-off. That was, everything was exactly right. All, all of the right elements happened to be in the right place for that to happen. Here... The, the feeling we've always had going into this show, I would say, is that it, it was actually quite easy. This is the general impression we've got, was that at around this time, dragon eggs were hatching a lot. And it was just, they, 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 were, uh, they didn't have to think about it so much. This was just, a, of course, dragon eggs hatch as other types of eggs hatch. Um, we know that there are problems later after the, the dance, but um, Aziz, I'm, I'm wondering with your sort of deep lore and knowledge hat, is there is there anything you can add coming into this that we should be looking out for in terms of how this process works of getting a, getting a new dragon? Yeah, I, I think that was some really good setup. You're right that the eggs, they didn't have to put a lot of effort into it. And one of the things that's the groundwork is laid is substantial, which is that these Targaryens are carrying on a tradition that's existed since old Valyria. So this is thousands of years of dragon rearing that they brought with them, that knowledge that by Danny's time is lost. Uh, so they don't have that anymore by her time. And maybe it's written down somewhere, but there aren't active practitioners. There aren't dragon keepers. Like we have these dudes who are sort of like monastic uh, ostlers, which is, you know, horse handler. So they're doing something much more important, it's much more dangerous, but although it's not really maybe that much more dangerous than like a real world snake handler, like poisonous snakes arguably are even more dangerous than dragons, uh, in, at least to a single, at least to individuals, not to cities. But <laughs> but um, so they, they have this knowledge base. They're just building off of or going, doing what people have done for thousands of years. There's little clues here with, the thing, the bolt that's in the side of Cyrax's neck that apparently uh, Ryan Condal said in an interview that that's a, a device that they implant in the dragon when they're young to help control it. But by the time of Cyrax's age, they've out, it's outgrown. So it's not used anymore. And uh, that as well, something well before Fire and Blood came out that I thought was really interesting and speaks to the Targaryen closeness to dragon riders, especially when you look at the case of the dragon seeds, many of whom died trying to mount dragons, there is zero, zero examples of a Targaryen being seriously injured by a dragon they were trying to tame. Certainly in the war, there's dragons who killed other Targaryens. But in terms of trying to mount a dragon that does not have a rider, there's no examples of a Targaryen even suffering serious harm, let alone death. Uh, no lost limbs, no severe burnings. And again, I'm only talking about full, uh, like definitively Targaryen people. So I always thought that was interesting. That's something we noticed a long time ago. And that seems to be carried mm -hmm. forward as part of that is there is some closeness. There is some magic involved, a supernatural connection, the actual blood of the dragon. But it's also heavily supported by this long-standing knowledge base that's been worked on and perfected over literal eons. 
Yeah, so I I think what we're going to get, what what I hope we're going to get from this show is a lot of background, hopefully not even um, having a light shone on it, uh, how this works. We've already seen like uh, the effectively a saddle with Rhaenyra like opening scene arrives in there it's not like Daenerys was like clinging on for dear life on the on the back of of Drogon there's clearly there's a system here and and then we get the the dragon keepers um I don't know have we got a, a special name for them or are they, are they just dragon keepers I think they're just dragon they're, keepers yeah I think they're just called dragon keepers um and uh they clearly have got ways of sort of uh trying to Herd a dragon, if that's the right word for, um, <laughs> for how you uh, try and get a dragon to go where you want. Um, but I, th I hope we will get a lot more of this, this kind of background information. There are some excellent bits in Fire and Blood where you get, um, particularly say before the Battle Above the God's Eye, when you read and Damon uh, did not chain himself to the saddle, and it's just like, oh, hang on. So that means that normally what they do is they sort of like literally chain themselves onto these. And that's the kind of the 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 level of detail that I'm hoping we get a lot more of from uh, from this. Um, in terms of hatching the dragon eggs, um, I well, I I think I'm, I'm just suddenly thinking: have, Are we going to see one in the dance? We get I don't know whether I show it. Morning is born during the dance. Um, there should be a couple others as well because all of the strong. The strong kids will have theirs hatch. None of those are yeah. existing dragons. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just Tyraxes, Vermax. Yeah. yeah, there should be a lot of hatchings. Potentially. I mean, they, they'll they may only show one, but there's plenty of them from, to choose from. <laughs> so it's possible that we'll see the the sort of the you know the Jurassic Park kind of thing of like the the, the, the dragon coming out of the egg, which would be pretty pretty amazing i think especially with the theme of childbirth this season they might want to show that aspect as well it would be it would kind of fit in a supernatural way <laughs> yes absolutely this is so yeah the, the 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 childbirth thing uh will come back there there's lots of babies lots are be of born, more kids uh, in, yeah. in <laughs> uh, so so don't yeah th this wasn't just a what i mean it was pretty um tough viewing uh but uh this wasn't yeah. just a, a one-off we are going to come back to this as a as a theme so i think a lot of and we'll only see later on a lot of episode one was setting up these themes i think does damon want to be king i think is, is one because mm. he sat there when almost introduced and he's like sat there on the iron throne just like this glorified jamie lannister kind of figure and it's yeah. just yeah um <laughs> we 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 will get um the um uh viserys as i say with the the getting scratched by the iron throne i'm sure is a theme that's going to come through again childbirth i'm thought, sure is a theme this kind of like uh the the different cultures the valyrian culture being established as being uh different to the culture of Westeros as a whole is also, I, I think, probably going to be a theme we're going to get coming through this. I have a quick question for you on the theme of. Sure. I think I think seeing an egg hatch is very likely, maybe even more than once. But do you? What about seeing a dragon lay eggs? You think we'll see that? That's I hadn't I hadn't thought of that till just now. That could be a fun moment to show. Wouldn't be wouldn't be too unpleasant. It, I think might be a little. It, it would. <laughs> I mean, I can't. Cool. I mean, I mean, if we're talking about themes of, as I say. Birth, I suppose that's um, uh, that's a part of the the process for dragons. I mean, I I can't, I don't think so. But um, uh, I mean, if you can just imagine all the CGI that they'd have to do to come up with that. Um, so, what what exactly does a dragon's uh, real <laughs> portion look like from this angle? Um, so, I, I don't know. It's uh, and and that would get us into the uh, the wonderful idea of. Uh, Dragon genitalia, of course. Yes, the, the is... wonder of birth. Yes, the miracle. Of... <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, I, I, I get this kind of feeling that um, they will probably just sort of take a little step back from that and uh, just let us imagine it. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Maybe just show a minute later. Like, there's the pile of eggs, not the... <laughs> uh... <laughs> yes, just a whole, a whole load of them. Um, <laughs> let's go to a question. Uh, well, this is a, a very practical question. I don't know whether you've got any insight on this one 444 um is asking about 
basically when are we going to see anything more because um yes it's been renewed uh but uh, is oh, this going to be yeah. one and a half years for filming and production that's basically what they took first time around for season one will we see anything in 2023 um where are the prequels at? Is are any of them going to be out in time for the, before we get to the season two of, of House of the Dragon? Do you? I mean, my I'll, I'll give my take, and I don't know whether you've got any more more sort of inside information on it. I I I hear sort of slightly different reports on season two when they're going to start filming season two, but in the not too distant future. So the the at, towards the end of this year or maybe the beginning of next year is what I have sort of vaguely heard they have been said they, they were expecting to renew this um in, unless it was like a something went terribly wrong so they have been getting writing scripts and, and getting everything set up and all the rest of it um the thing which i think we've not really commented on much is the length of these episodes which is um 10 episodes in a season uh, yes but if you go back to like early Game of Thrones seasons, then most episodes were 40, 45 minutes, something like that. We've had the first episode, I think, was well over an hour, 65, yeah. 66 minutes, something like that. I understand that the average is over an hour for each of these 10 episodes. Some are a bit, a bit shorter, but some of them also a bit longer. And it's it's that's a lot more. So that's the, once you add up all of that, that's probably the equivalent of like, a 12 episode season of early game of thrones so that is a lot of filming and there is a lot of cgi so yeah i i would not be surprised if it's uh, summer 2024 till we see this but i mean have you got any sort of more updates on that or where or when we might see any of these spin-offs happening yeah, um, I do have a little bit of insight on that. I, I What I've heard also sort of tracks with what you've heard, that they are going to take a little longer between seasons. So it might be a year and a half-ish or maybe a full two years before we get a season two. But you are absolutely right. They behaved as if it was renewed before it was renewed. They did start working on it already. Uh, I doubt they've put a lot of budget into it, but they started writing, which is, is a lower, mm. you know, that that is a lot less cost associated without just starting the writing. So I also don't think any successor shows will be ready that quickly because part of, as we discussed earlier, part of the hold on some of those is seeing how well House of the Dragon did. So now that it's having such great success, that should kick some of those more into momentum. But these things take a while. They're not, they don't have casts. They don't have sets. So yeah, it's, I think we're still a couple years away from where we could expect to have at least one show a year and we may within four or five years we may have two shows a year but i think that we're still it's still ramping up the the signs are there that we're going to get there but it, it takes time yeah because they these things yeah it, it, if you want it good you got to take their time yeah. they can't just uh, they can't rush it so and some some of these spin-offs have been They've been in the works for a while now. They, uh, George yeah. Martin said on a previous Not a Blog, I think he, he said about the Nine Voyages one or the Nymeria one, that I, I think they're like on third or fourth versions of a, a, a script, um, which to my mind is starting to get to the point where you have to make a decision on it because it's um, you can't just keep on rewriting something. If, if you Agreed. think this is not going somewhere, then you just pull the plug. Um, but I, I will be intrigued, and I do not genuinely do not know. I don't have any inside track to HBO on this. HBO tended always tended to do the we're doing a pilot, and then we'll decide whether to green light something, uh, and that's what they started off with with the Game of Thrones spinoffs. We had that the first spinoff that they were planning on doing, the one that George R. R. Martin wanted to call the Long Night. Um, that uh, they did do a. Uh, a pilot they did spend quite a lot of money on it reports are i think over 30 million dollars on this yeah. pilot mm -hmm. um and then decided not to go ahead with it but then turned around and i think almost the next day said so how was of the dragon it was the same the day season. it was the same day yeah it was it, it was, that was the some, same day that was and, a wild day <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it was it was <coughs> pardon me it was very much a matter of 
this is a complete change of tack. They're not going with the the pilot thing anymore. They're just going straight in with the season. Now that may work. well have been yeah. part due to confidence in the product. And it may well have been part due to the fact that they thought we'll be we have to get something up and running soon. Um, but I will be fascinating to see whether they go down this route for these other things. Are, are they going to do a Jon Snow spin-off pilot, or would they just go straight to a season order for it? Um, That's a tough question, I, yeah. Um, I think, I think let's some go. of them, they'll probably have to have pilots, but maybe maybe some of the others, there's, yeah, maybe one of the other gets, gets sort of whatever the word would be, uh, grandfathered past that process. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's, it's noticeable that in now we're entering this streaming world. I say entering the streaming world. We've been mm -hmm. here for a while. But Getting deeper in the <laughs> at entering the streaming world um, and slowly trying to figure out where they're going with this. If you go to Star Wars, Disney, Marvel, they don't say we're now going to do a whole load of pilots for this obi-wan kenobi show or the boba fett they just say we're now doing a boba fett, boba fett show we're now yeah. doing obi-wan kenobi show and then they're just doing it so they've just got rid of this whole pilot idea entirely i'll be fascinated with hbr moving over onto that that model as well yeah you wonder if it's just something that they're doing for financial reasons they're like well they don't want to blow 35 million on a pilot then maybe they just like get their ducks in or make sure the show is look use other indicators to show whether the, the show will be a success before they make it and maybe it costs them less to do that initial investment yeah i i suspect there is some financial decisions were pretty big in that regard but also there's been a lot of change over at hbo in terms of the top people at the top um since game of thrones season eight so that that's part of it as well and stuff that that's the kind of information we're not so privy to we don't know what kind of decisions they make behind closed doors but i think that's an underrated factor that Quite a few people have changed over. In, like, for, for example, the previous HBO president, I believe, was quoted as saying, I don't want HBO to become the Game of Thrones network, which was kind of a disappointing thing for us to hear. But that guy's gone. So maybe some other like investors were like, get rid of him. We do want HBO to be the Game of Thrones network. Is he, is he stupid? How much yeah. money they can make? No, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. But that the guy that said that isn't around anymore. <laughs> so, well. So it's back on the table. I mean, I don't think they're ever going to yeah. be the the Game of Thrones network. Even, I mean, even even if they're doing two or three shows a year, they they they're doing some as, as, yeah. as a business. They've always been trying to invest in new drama rather than just go with yeah. the, the the same thing. Okay. Let's get to a question from Andy Q. This is picking up on one of the other things that got a lot of people talking. It was a language issue in in episode one in, in the best possible way. Uh, Andy says, after hearing the Promise Me reference, it got me thinking. Um, and the Promise Me reference here was the way that we had the voiceover at the end of the episode. Viserys was say, having given all this information to uh, to Rhaenyra. He's then saying, uh, uh, "Do uh, will you do this? Uh, will you take the take on this burden? Promise me, Rhaenyra." Which obviously has this. Um, echo back to the famous promise promise me that liana says to ned so the question is do you think that liana told ned about the prophecy um perhaps his broken promises not only included keeping john safe but one day passing on the details of the prophecy there are indications that perhaps the targaryens and starks did share knowledge in the past makes sense Rhaegar may have told Lyanna about the prophecy to convince her that it was necessary to set aside his wife. So this is, I mean, it was a fascinating choice of words, and they did use quite a lot of Lyanna-ish imagery. That It looked like uh, there was like the, uh, the the winter roses, the blue roses were there, with Alicent mm -hmm. had them as her favour. Um, we have the promise me thing. So yes, there was a lot of echo there. Do you think as a first part of the question is, do you think that they this was deliberate to make us think about that in some way? Or was it just, mm. hey, this is cool wording. It shows that we know the law. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think I think it probably shows, maybe it shows communication. It might show the concept we indicated before, which is that this is a future event and there are means to see what's coming in the future in this world it's usually prophecy and it's usually in the form of dreams 
Uh, sometimes it's happens in the waking world, but it's possible they simply discovered the same information through their own magical supernatural means or through people in their ancestry that discovered it and passed it down. I do think there probably was communication. They find they, they discovered each other's knowledge at some point, whether it was Aegon speaking to Torin or something that came out of that. Maybe they said, Hey, we need to talk about this more. Let's, let's settle all this conquest soldiery mm. business. And then we'll sit down and chat about this some more. Although there's, not a whole lot of indication that they spoke a lot after that, given that Aegon didn't go back to Winterfell for such a long time. Um, it could be that th that may be a hint that they didn't coordinate on that, because if they knew if they had things to say to each other, you'd think they would have met again. They wouldn't have just said it all in that one meeting and never corresponded again. Maybe there were ravens back and forth, but that implies they'd be writing down things that, that maybe wouldn't have been written down. You know, like, I, I don't know that they would have put this kind of stuff in messages passed back and forth by Raven. On the other hand, Rhaegar and, and A. Maester Aemon did exactly that. They wrote each other letters, probably discussing prophecy. So we definitely can't dismiss that. Um, so I, at this point, I don't, it's hard to, hard to be sure. I, I suspect that they, that at some point, the ice prophecies and the fire prophecies were discussed by people who knew of the other one and that only would have made them more sure that they were onto something uh i can't that that part i feel confident on that if they had these conversations it would have only made them more certain that they that this was real um but but it's hard to get at who would have had these communications other than maybe Aegon and Torin. and as i've said there's some there's some possible issues with even them discussing it uh, jason uh, jace as well maybe could have talked to cregan about it that's another possibility mm. So, but hmm, it's, it's this right now, it's hard to get at this. Maybe this is, this is partly a function of us having only been thinking about this for about a week now. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I, I mean, I think the, the, the Rhaegar question is Andy's question about the Rhaegar and Lyanna. Rhaegar was clearly very prophecy driven. And oh, yeah. uh, I, I think it's um, overwhelmingly likely that he told Lyanna some yeah. elements of this maybe even all of it to get her um, buy-in yeah yeah and Ilya too i think ex exactly and um so she will have the bit we don't know is the extent to which she bought into this and the importance of it um the implication i guess is maybe she did to some degree because um she was so strong on the uh Robert Baratheon's going to be seeing other women kind of thing. And then suddenly, yes, the Targaryens are a whole lot more sort of uh, polyamorous than the Starks, but Lyanna doesn't ever give the impression of, of of wanting to be like the second wife. So there's something going on there that has to have had some kind of negotiation at, at the very least. Um, so explain some of the Kingsguard's actions too, on top of all this. Yeah. Yes. Um, so... If she knows this, the promise me thing I think is fascinating because it's one of those little bits that you can you can miss the detail is that when Ned is in the black cells, he is being filled with regret for broken promises, mm. which is an it really interesting because it's not a promise. We we tend to think of this being, you know, promise me Ned means like uh, protect my son full stop that's it and that's the thing that he's there but he did that so that's not what he's thinking of as being yeah. a broken promise so didn't break that promise that's true there's mm. something else going on here maybe the context is clearly about this in some way um my take thus far has always been well maybe the other thing would have been telling him who he was when it was safe to do so Okay, you can bring him up and with a false identity, but at some point, tell him who his mother and father were. Uh, promise me that, and that's kind of leads up to he now thinks that this is a broken promise because he was going to do that, but then he handed him over to Benjamin at the wall. They had a talk. We know that they had a talk about something secret, um, and so he kind of handed over this role to Benjamin, and he just heard that Benjamin's lost and probably going to be probably dead 
and he's in the black cells and he thinks, oh, well, that's it. I've I've failed in the promise. That was my take mm -hmm. I've had all the way through this. It is an intriguing one, the idea that maybe there was more to this. Maybe she said, you've got to tell him about this prophecy. You've got to tell him about whatever. Is that something else that Ned's been carrying around with him all that yeah. time? That would add an extra layer to all of this angst that Ned has been carrying. Um, uh, I mean, what, yeah. do you, what do you make I of that? Do you think... Do you think that's possible? Absolutely. It's very possible. I mean, the promise, like you said, it's just a promise to tell him who he was. And this is part of potentially part of who he was or mm. part of who he is, is this what his parents believed was a the prince that was promised. They believe that he's prophesied uh, or that he has this magical um, destiny. And that would be something that if Liana had buy in on this, which it does seem like it's more than just falling for Rhaegar, although that might be part of it that they believe their child was a child of destiny. And that is far beyond just, yes, make sure my child is safe, which yeah, you're right. He did that. John was pretty safe as of Ned being in the black cells. Like, yeah, he maybe doesn't have the best life, but no one's like trying to come murder him. No one, he's not being actively hunted by anyone. He's hmm. about as safe as someone can be in Westeros, given the wall at that stage is, not as dangerous as it becomes later <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a, the safest place ever but few places yeah. in westeros are so yeah i think it's absolutely possible i mean it would add so much more gravitas to what ned's the secret and why it also helps explain why he didn't tell catlin which has been a long running like he could have told his wife why didn't he trust his wife well if it's this on top of everything it isn't just who that kid is in terms of identity it's the magical destiny on top of all that, which is like, which is maybe something he would be reluctant to share, especially if that was part of the promise. Because you know, you can't tell anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> which it would, it would be weird for her to insist not telling him, telling other people if it was just to keep him safe. But if it was to keep the whole world safe, <laughs> it's a, it changes it from keep this child safe to save everyone <laughs> via yeah. this child. So, yeah. so Ned in this. Uh, idea we've got here ned actually literally did save the world by keeping something quiet all that time and allowing the what he saw as the public shame of 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 having uh this bastard child what that was him saving the world keeping that a secret yeah that's that adds an, a whole extra layer to it so I, I i do like that one quite a lot yeah it's really good that it's gonna be it's a great thing that requires further further uh, a re rereading i suppose we'll have to go back and valar reread all that all that ned so who knew he'd have yet another reason to reread ned i mean <laughs> <laughs> well the, the, the thing with Ned is that he it's he is blocking things from his own memory so there is there, there's already stuff there when we're reading stuff from his point of view that we know that we're we're not being told everything yeah uh but the hints are there all the way through about what the real truth is. You mean there there are chapters there when he's like um, holding the baby, uh, and and then it's like he then immediately starts thinking about uh, Leanna, and then he starts thinking about John, and it's just like oh okay, so there's a link across here. So there's <laughs> lots of that kind of thing. But yeah, I don't think we've gone back at any point. I mean, maybe George hadn't even thought about it at this point, but um, I don't think anyone's gone back and looked to see. Is is there something here where it feels like Ned's holding back on a prophecy that he's been? Yeah, I, I do not recall discourse about that. <laughs> there's no. Maybe there's there's bound to be a little of it because people have gone through, but nothing that was had the, the great attention of the like the the majority of us. So theories are coming. They they absolutely are. <laughs> Diego Godoy saying, "Hola, Robert. Hola." Um, how quickly into the season do you think we'll be seeing the change in relationship between Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole? I mean, that happened before she had any children, so presumably quite soon. Thanks, and please tell Aziz that, uh, that he did a great job in the interview with George R. R. Martin. And thank Walter you, Parker. thank you. Uh, so happy to pass that on. Uh, the Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole, I mean, this, this happens before she's married so before yeah. she's married before she has babies so yeah i think we can probably expect to see it i mean i i have no real idea about the pacing of this but it has to be before halfway through the season one would have thought uh, yeah so I yeah know, i agree episode three or four something like that 
Yeah, uh, we can be pretty sure. I know you've seen it already, so you know one way or the other, but from the, the preview stills, King Kristen Cole's already in Kingsguard armor. So this episode, he's probably gets names to the Kingsguard, and then he's going to have proximity to her, and that's when young hot blood gets running i suppose and i think part of it's going to be framed as a little bit of rebelliousness because she doesn't want to be a royal womb she wants to have and that one way to push back against being forced to breed is to choose your own lover um which she's not going to be allowed to do and we also know that the person that's going to be pushed on her as a husband is not interested in women so it's going to be doubly un unpleasant for her on a personal mm -hmm. level she's going to have a husband that's not interested in her and she's not going to be terribly interested in him probably for the same reason you know like what well, she wouldn't have she didn't choose him so like that's always fraught with peril imagine someone else picking your partner for you i mean ew, that does not sound good uh but uh, so yeah it has to start pretty soon i think we've already seen them like looking at each other at the tournament and she was noticing him right away and yeah, but I'm really curious how they're going to play it because it's another example of fire and blood has all these different takes, all these different sources that report it differently. Like Kristen Cole approached her or that she approached him or yeah, we don't know which it's going to be. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I'm curious to see how they'll weigh in and I'm curious to see how they'll yeah. maybe try to maintain some of that ambiguity like they did with the air for a day scene was probably the best example of them showing the ambiguity from fire and blood. But there's other examples as well. And this is this is a this one I don't know if they can be as ambiguous about because if they're behind closed doors going at it, you know, that's that happened. You know, we're, <laughs> we don't even know from Fire Blood for sure that they ever hooked up. But I don't know that they'll be able to keep it so unclear here on the show. Yeah, I think that's one of those ones where they they do have to make a decision in some some ways because otherwise it doesn't make sense. You can't yeah. just pull away and say, "Well, who knows what happened here?" Um, the, I agree completely. That was one one of my thoughts about that scene with the air for the day is that cutting away allowed us to decide, uh, not really whether it happened. I think I think it's clear that it did happen. It's it's how it was done is, yeah. is the issue. And I, that, that I think was yeah. really good on the showrunner's part because they, um, they honed in on this one thing that makes you wonder, not just about, you know, is there a truth to this or not? Is this somebody making up lies? No, this did happen, but how that line was delivered the very next line it would have changed absolutely everything. So, um, yeah, I really, uh, I really appreciated that. I thought that worked really well. Um, one other fantastic little question or uh, comment in the chat. Sort of the morning. This is going back to the conversation we we're having just one moment ago about Ned uh, and whether we need to reread Ned. Saying maybe this is why Ned didn't want Robert to kill the other Targs. Um, which oh. is a fascinating observation mm. because Ned, if it, um, Ned was very focused in on Targaryens not being Targaryen children not being killed. Now, I and probably you as these and many others have always assumed this is just a little bit of extra evidence that it's uh, uh, Ned is just he knows about John or he's uh, instinctively thinks that that. that Maybe there is Leanna is going to have a child that is uh, is a Targaryen baby, um, and that is that that's why it's feeling so personal for him. But he does react very strongly, both the first time around when Rhaegar's kids are killed, and then the second time around when uh, the decision is made: let's hire um, assassin to try and kill Daenerys. Is it, maybe this is also that he's got this thought in the back of his head. There's a, there's a, a prophecy here. Maybe it isn't just about John. Maybe it could well be about Daenerys. I mean, who knows? It's it's a an, another angle to come at this from. You see a sort of egg on the conqueror's dilemma there too. You just can't go around telling people about this. Like, would people like Ned could not have used this as an argument against Robert? It's like Robert, you can't kill Targaryens because it's going to end the world. He'd be like what <laughs> like what the hell yeah. are you talking about <laughs> so it, it's what however ned reacts he can't use it as his argument or as any part of the evidence he has to couch it in i mean human terms like 
let's not kill babies, Robert. You know, <laughs> not you, Robert. Yeah. But <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I mean, I'm I'm not in favor of killing babies. Just for the record, okay. right on. Okay, um, good. Good thing and, we uh, Dean out. Brown in the chat saying <laughs> Ned yeah. Justice likes children dying. In my opinion, like the good yeah. guy he is. Yeah, and and this is we're always overanalyzing these things. That, that I mean, this is actually just a basic human response. Is that well, you're killing babies? Let's not yeah, do like, that. Or, not do or that, you know, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> hiring assassins for somebody who's hundreds, thousands of miles away. Um, so yeah, it's that there, there is definitely a Ned's actually just a good guy kind of level to all of this as well. And that's part of why it's so well hidden because yes, it works super well as Ned is a decent man. And that that's why part of why we stop there and don't look for more reasons because that is more than enough of a reason, but it doesn't mean there isn't more reason, right? That's just why our, our brain is, we don't have any suspicion <laughs> there. It's like, mm. what if Ned has more reason than just not liking to kill babies? Like, well, I don't know why you would go there. Like, that is enough reason, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're just really digging and looking, you may have stumbled on that idea, but it, it, it's, it, it is natural to stop looking at that point to be like, oh, that's... It's plenty of reason, you know. Ned, he's per he's got a personal uh, thing because of John being Targaryen, and because he's a good man. He doesn't want <laughs> he doesn't want babies to die. That's pretty straightforward. So yeah, George is really good at concealing uh, supernatural things behind f mundane, fundamental like human emotions. Uh, good job, George. Hey, look, Robert, we 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 got that fifteen hundo. We're at fifteen oh eight. Oh, excellent news! Oh, fantastic! Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so yeah, we we we're now up to. Um, I mean, I, I haven't really got a, an, an aim for where we're going to with all of this <laughs> over the course of the season, but uh, yeah, that's five hundred dollars raised today for Alzheimer's care and uh, uh, research. Thank you. That that money will go a hugely long way, um, and it will help some people who are. Uh, going through some uh, horrible times so uh, thank you very much um there is still time to donate uh that's that's not uh time to stop uh feel free <laughs> if, you, if you have the money to spare and if you wish to um uh, show a little bit of uh, uh support or thanks for for what if you're enjoying the stream then please do right um right let's go to um Oh, actually, Andrew Kay, this is just a, this is sort of a connected before I go on to, I've got a couple more questions for my patrons, but this is sure. an interesting one. Andrew Kay saying, another aspect I've been thinking about with this prophecy reveal was pre-madness Eris II did want to build a second wall north of the current one. Um, I mean, he had a lot of crazy sort of like big infrastructure projects he had going on. But yeah, this one always stood out as being a little bit of a, uh a, a sort of a fun do you do you think there is anything to this well it, it's one way to show that aries had dreams i think it's an idea to to make it clear that aries had to suggest that he had dreams beyond just ideas of where to build things it's also a way to tie him to cersei because a lot of aries's ideas are the same as cersei like aries wanted to rebuild king's landing on the other side of the blackwater so did cersei aries was mm -hmm. aries got into a dispute with the iron bank so did Cersei, <laughs> you know, all these, this parallel, the same small council full of lickspittles. So I think that's part of it is to draw, draw these parallels. Although as we saw from the George interview, he doesn't always do these parallels on purpose. So uh, it's just similar rulers with similar traits that do similar things. So yeah, uh, I don't know. How, I guess we shouldn't assume all that was fully intentional, but either way it works to suggest quite a lot. But I think that's another thing to look back on Aries. Like, yeah, Ares becomes really interesting with some of these revelations. For one thing, if you're Rhaegar, and Rhaegar did believe in the prophecies as clearly as anyone mm. did, we're also told he got it from some books. Because if his father was telling him this stuff, would you believe it? Like if the Mad King is like telling you mm. that the world is going to end, that this great wintry darkness is coming, would you believe? Like, sure, Dad, sure, Ares. Yeah, sure. Tell, we believe you. But if if it's a family secret that predates him then there would be a lot less reason to doubt it but it depends on how he was told either way he got it, it, it it's there were there were corroborating sources it seems even if he did get it from aries so um i think it does imply that aries had dreams i think that some of them were supernatural i think the dreams were probably about daenerys rather than about maybe some of the same stuff that egg on the conqueror dreamt of because he wanted to immerse himself in fire and thought he would emerge as a dragon which is pretty much what daenerys did 
And kind of what Arian Brightflame did by thinking Wildfire would turn him into a dragon. And, and Summer Hall was about Wildfire and dragon eggs as well. So there's all these, the, the closer you get to Daenerys, you have these dreams and behavior of Targaryens who probably had dreams. We don't know, we don't know that they all had dreams, but between the two, there's dreams from Ares and strange actions taken by some of the ones who came before him. And it all, they all seem to align pretty well under this umbrella of prophecy and, and uh, the world going to end, but mixed in with their madness. Now, the madness also is a little like chicken and the egg sort of situation. Well, the madness because of this, how much of the madness comes from thinking the world is going to end and they have this pressure on them to do that? And how much of them is because of their incest? <laughs> and, <you know. laughs> I, I think one of the things that, that George R. Martin does with Duncan Egg is he's got this character called uh, Diran the Drunken, yeah. um, who is, uh, he's a brother to egg and mr Eamon and he he gets these dragon dreams and we know he gets them right we we hear one he has this vision about uh dunk that comes true um and we're told that it was just all too much for him getting these yeah. dreams and that was why he basically gave into alcoholism he he just like uh, he he couldn't cope so he had to keep on drinking to stop these dreams cramming into his head which is the same kind of feel for what if you don't go down that route, but you just like embrace it? And if all your dreams are about fire, then you go down the Eris the second route to become mm. the mad king. So, yeah, that's the kind of feel I think we've got there is that one or two dreams here or there, okay, fair enough. But if you're getting them all the time, then that is actually going to have some, you know, play some serious havoc with your mental health. Um, great point. And I thing, think, let me add one little thing onto that real quick. Um, Ares was a young man, a teenager, when Summer Hall happened, and he witnessed it. So you take what should be, probably was, a traumatic event using wildfire, and then mix it with these dreams. And you get someone that, you can see why that would be very deeply conflicting, deeply, uh, like, how do you sleep? At, how do you get good rest? Mm. Like, how, how many people out there are just are off? on the day following bad rest, like you had nightmares. Yeah, just picture having them every night. And also knowing that there's, your family members have been having these for a long time and that they actually believe that they're real and that it, it's, it portends the end of the world. Yeah, that would, I could see that, like you said, having an impact on your mental health. Yeah, maybe that's even putting it mildly, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, yeah. But yeah. It's, it's so the, the, the dreams, I mean, the way George R. R. Martin said it in one of the interviews, I can't remember which one it was, uh, he, he said that it's this great sprawling thing now is how he described this uh, Targaryen dreams and visions kind of idea. And you can start to draw this thread is that the dreams seem to have started with get out of Valyria. Then they got into let's go over to Westeros. Um then we've got uh, something which uh, we're not entirely sure what the, the the dreams and visions are, but it's the your the, the role here is to um, to save the world. So we've got to be uniting the kingdoms, something along those lines. But then we get increasingly we need to get the dragons back, um, which gets into Danny in her early chapters. She gets these dragon dreams. I mean, we forget about them because we are all concentrating on the fact she gets dragons. But two or three times she gets literal dragon dreams. She dreams about dragons hatching. And then later on, she gets this other dream about riding on a dragon and basically mowing down a whole load of um, ice warriors with dragon fire. So it's almost as if the dreams are getting honing in to exactly what it is. We need you in this place. We need the dragons back. We need you to use the dragon to do this thing. And it's over time, they slowly start moving over there. The one thing I find fascinating when I was going through, I did a video last week on this, when I was going through all the Targaryens with these dreams, two of them have dreams about Dunk, which is fascinating because Dunk, I the, obviously we love the character, but he, he doesn't come across as magical 
that so much magical stuff around him is going on all the time. He is he is like this kind of like load around which uh, magic happens. It's like world. when Makoro says the dragons are all around Tyrion, like <laughs> like yeah. y'all old and new, bright and dark. Yeah, that's <laughs> Dunk is to so, say. <laughs> and, and and it's just so Dunk is very important, and I suspect all the way through to Summerhall he will be very important in and around the lives of the Targaryens. So, you know, we first meet him, his first adventure there. Uh, the future king dies because of Dunk. Um, his, he's worrying about his foot. How is this foot going to save the kingdom kind of thing? And then <laughs> you know, he happens to stumble across a massive rebellion plot in, in, in another adventure. And it's just like, okay, so this is... Uh, you know, uh, another one, the other one, he just happens to be in the exact one part of the Seven Kingdoms with <laughs> Egg at the time that that's the only bit really that didn't get this deadly disease that killed a whole load of other people. So he's important. He's absolutely central to all of this. Um, but I said we've got a couple of questions left from patrons. Um, Emma Scheiman saying, Hi, Robert. I've heard that tonight's episode will have a full length intro a la Game of Thrones. I can neither confirm nor deny that, which I'm excited about. But I have some questions based on the single image intro we got last week, which I haven't gone back to look at actually. Uh, so I'm hoping that, Aziz, you remember this. Mm -hmm. Do you think it was intentional that the intro card, a golden dragon on a black field, mirrored Aegon II's banner and not Rhaenyra's? In Fire and Blood, there's a good amount of emphasis on how uniquely beautiful Aegon's golden dragon was. Uh, yeah. But our first introduction to dragons on this show was Rhaenyra on a very golden-looking Cyrax. Do you think we will end up with our claimants on similar-looking dragons? what's your take on all of this? Yeah, I definitely agree that they're going a little more gold with Cyrax versus yellow. They made that, they laid that groundwork right away by having Harold Westerling call Cyrax that golden beast rather than that yellow beast. So yeah, I think they might be trying to draw that distinction to show the two main claimants have similar, similar colored dragons. Yeah, it is interesting that that's Aegon's symbol and she goes with the, in the Fire and Blood, she goes with a quartered Targaryen Aaron Valarian symbol, but they may not do that in the show. They may go for both of them using the sigil and, and trying to say it's theirs. So I, I suspect they might do that differently because yeah, that is a little telling if it's if that's just one of their sigils and not the other, then mm. that is a little a little unusual. Um I mean yeah. George R. R. Martin did on the sigils thing. This was one of the the three things that apparently he said, I desperately want you to get right in the house of the dragon mm. um uh the other two um off the top of my head there was the sigils there was the um jaharis the second he wanted back into the timeline and there was one other thing um but yeah this was definitely something he was very clear on that he wanted more individual um uh, bits of heraldry going on so that people could see where everyone was from because that was an important part of his world yeah. Okay. One more question from uh, my patrons. Uh, then I'll try and pick up a few more things in the chat as we go through. Then uh, we'll try and round it off in about another 10 minutes or so, I think. So everyone's got a, enough Perfect. time for a dog walk and a cup of tea before uh, the uh, the mm -hmm. episode or whatever exactly. floats your boat. Yeah. Um, uh, question and uh, Aziz, I don't know whether you've. Uh, You've done any thinking on this one recently, but Glenn Thrasher said, did the Maesters kill the boy Balon Targaryen? I don't think so. I, I was suspicious of that, but here's my clue, is that newborn babies cry very loudly, almost exclusively. This baby was barely vocal at all. It was like the baby comes out, it was weak right away. Mm. and that didn't last for like apparently died quickly uh because like the major's holding him he's rocking him and the baby's barely making any sound if that was a healthy child it'd be screaming and crying i'm pretty sure that's universal maybe i'm wrong i'm not exactly a expert on newborns but pretty sure that was our clue that the child was born very weak and uh, if he did want to murder the child it would have been easy given the child seems to have already been weak let's put it that way so i we can't rule it out but there's plenty of evidence that the child was already weak to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the other element to this is, um, 
our next collaboration is a is a video uh, <laughs> which is looking afresh at this great maester conspiracy within the context of this build up to the dance of the dragons i've previously done a video uh looking at it in the context of just after the dance of the dragons i'm fully subscribed to this idea that the maesters are uh, shady as and uh, they poisoned the dragon eggs um but the question is how involved were they in stuff in the build-up to the dance of the dragons uh, because suddenly we've got a whole load more evidence going on here now uh, i always Try and spoil my own videos. Uh, so so let's, uh, let's come, come up with a couple of these things. Um, one thing you noticed was the tepid bath thing. Um, yeah. You, which you think might be a, a sort of a possible hint about the maester's uh, intentions here? Yeah, it's not a big clue, but it's something. If you're looking for evidence of their setting things up and being subtle... Then we look at the fact that Daenerys loved hot baths. She was very happy with hot baths. They were surprised how hot she liked her baths. And now we have this maester saying no hot baths. And they're joking about it. The fact that they joke about it draws attention to it. She, Viserys is like, don't they know dragons prefer heat? You know, and they're, it's, it's lighthearted the way it's said. But yeah, our, is this more evidence that Melos is just maybe not a great healer? Or is it evidence that they're maybe trying to do a little sabotage here? And the reason why there is extra room for conspiracy here is because the maesters come from the Citadel. The Citadel is in Old Town. Old Town is run by the High Towers. Otto High Tower is Hand of the King. Pretty straightforward connection there. And we've got Otto being pulled. We've got Melos in the scene where they decide to name Rainier heir, uh, Melos sets Otto up. Melos says, well, we could go with the original law. And everybody's like, what do you mean? And Otto says, the king's firstborn child. Like they, one person starts the sentence, the other person finishes it. So it's like they were acting in concert there. So by itself, this is not evidence of a conspiracy. But if a conspiracy emerges, we will absolutely look back on these things as evidence of it. <laughs> right? We'll be like yeah. there and there and there. And those are those are all possible clues. So. Yeah, not enough to, to fully sink your teeth in, I'd say. But if you're suspicious, I'd say you're some of those suspicions are absolutely still in play, if not inflamed a bit. Well, and I'm going to throw one other thing in here by way of a, a tease for the video. So say sure. one um, uh, one thing I I can remember when I first read Fire and Blood, it it kind of like rung a bell and made me go, well, that's that sounds a bit odd. Uh, but now having seen this it makes it, it seem even more odd which is the um great council of 101 at harren hall where we get told that uh, yes in the book this is between lanor and viserys whereas on the show they had it rainus and viserys but the the thing is still the same is that this seems to have been uh organized by the maesters they counted all of the ballots and they did yeah. not say how many you know what the result was they except for now announce this name this is the next king and that comes across as a little bit weird you can then add on um what we read in fire and blood was whose idea was this for there to be a great council actually curiously this was from a guy called Vaymond who is a Targaryen, but became a maester. And he got summoned to talk to Jaehaerys, who was thinking about maybe we could get make this guy king. And actually, they emerged from this saying, why don't we have a great council? The maesters can run it. The maesters can count everything. And the thing which struck me when I was reading Fire and Blood was that uh, much is made uh, there. Gildane writes that uh, we, we don't know what the exact results were, but it was understood that the um, the vote was more than more than 20 to 1 in favour of Viserys. And when I read that, I thought, wow, that's really that's, a <laughs> landslide. that's like more than 95 percent. That's that's not what you get in most democracies. This is like no. this is the kind of dictator level of, uh, and then you get, and then it follows on and says, so you you see, okay, so has Valarion clearly didn't vote that way, but also two of the seven great houses, the Starks and the Baratheons, didn't vote that way. Plus, we've got a handful of other houses that are quite significant, the Blackwoods. 
the Dustins, the Mandalays, the Celtigars, we're told that they didn't vote that way. Suddenly, this 95% plus in favor of Viserys sounds a little bit shady. Yeah, that's a um, good point. I never thought about it this way. The, it's, hmm. it's, it's a bit, I mean, it's not proof, but what we don't know, and this is starting to get into uh, kind of nerdy sort of political territory, is that who got to vote? Because this is a this is another strange thing is that is it did whoever turned up got a vote? Um, did all their votes count equally? Exactly. Yeah. The high does, lords does vote the, the same Stark, as the lordlings. Does the yeah. Starks get one vote and also the Mandalays get one vote? Is that is that that doesn't sound quite right in the yeah. way that this world is set up? We have questions. And if it is <laughs> people who turn up, surely that favors the people who are living close to uh, where it is, rather than mm. I mean, how many. Are, are we expecting all of the people from the far north to be heading down? Yes, I'm sure the Starks sent their delegation and a few of the other big houses, but are we really expecting all of the minor houses in the north to come? So, that, Were the car Starks there? Are they really going to be heading all the way down south for this kind of business? Probably not. But the Tim Pot little lord who happens to live, you know, um, uh, Rosbys and people like that, they'll definitely be turning up because they're yeah. only a few miles down the road. Exactly. So, there's a lot in here that we can. Uh, uh, the maesters suggested it. The maesters counted the results. The maesters didn't mm. say who it was, um, uh, and they also ended up putting uh, a high tower in there as hand of the king. So, if you're looking um, for some kind of uh, conspiracy, I think there's a possibility there. But anyway, yeah. that's my spoiler for the video that we've got coming up. That that was my. You can tell the bits that I came up with and the bits that Aziz came up with. So <laughs> We tend, we tend to work. The way we, we get passionate about that kind of thing. But um, uh, that was uh, that was the last question from my patrons. Um, is that, was there anything in the? Oh, Curtis Franks in the chat clarifying. Yeah, Georgia Martin wanted three things uh, from the show in particular: Jaehaerys the second to be reintroduced into the mm. timeline, sigils and dragon colors. Yeah, that was a thing that he was very keen on because in Game of Thrones, then the dragons sort of kind of merged into one sort of color and you couldn't really tell the difference between them yeah he wanted there to be a difference uh there um is there anything in the chat that you've um uh, bob dylan bizarrely i didn't know bob dylan was watching hi there bob hey, saying bob is in deep peak behaving himself i am indeed uh you can <laughs> uh, you don't need to worry about that um is there anything you've spotted in the chat that you think that um it'd be good just to sort of pick up on um i don't think so uh yeah i think that the one slight downside of having so many people here is it is hard to keep up with the chat <laughs> but that's a good reason it's, it's quite thing. hard a lot yes. of people are um, here and the the donations have been coming in that's great so yeah i'd say this has been an excellent session and uh really looking forward to how much this just fires me up for the rest of the season even more Excellent. Well, uh, in that case, what we will do is, uh, Aziz, why don't you um, just remind everybody where they can find you on the internet? Cool. Well, yeah, we're at History of Westeros podcast. That's on YouTube or Spotify or Amazon Music or Google Play, all the different places you watch videos or listen to podcasts. You can find us. And we are all throughout the season. We're streaming Mondays at six for non-spoilery episodes and Saturdays at three. Uh, for preview slash spoiler episodes so that's all season long and of course we're uh, doing collab videos with robert on and off all the way through and in the off season so plenty of stuff coming from us hit us up with a subscription and you'll see for yourself if you haven't already excellent there's a link down in the description and as i say i would highly recommend you go if you haven't already uh, and go and have a watch of that uh interview with george ella martin um, that was uh those were eastern times by the way i see someone asking so yeah <laughs> um in terms of what's coming up on this channel um as always my uh, episode breakdown will be up within 24 hours of the episode itself airing so you've got that to look forward to you've got the the video that we spoiled just a few moments ago which will be coming up as well uh, quite soon and the rings of power is starting up this week thursday or friday depending on uh, your time zone um two episodes dropping at the same time and then it's going weekly one one a week after that um 
I'll be doing the same kind of thing there. My Thursday live streams will be turning into uh, pre-show live streams for the Rings of Power, and then I'll be doing episode breakdowns uh, after each episode as well, as well as a few awesome. of that random extra episodes and, and little bits of talking lore here and there. Um, okay, I will make Aziz disappear for just one moment so I can point at things. Uh, if you are watching back a little bit later, appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to other live streams, and appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to uh, my uh, Patreon. If you wish to support this uh, channel and support what I do, that is the best way to do it. Uh, but thank you so much, Aziz. It's been an absolute delight and a pleasure. Um, thank you, chat moderators. Uh, you were amazing as always. Uh, thank you for everyone who donated. We did get up to... Uh, where do we get up to? 1,500 we're up to now. So uh, excellent. Let's see whether we can keep this pace up for the next one. Uh, take care, everyone. I shall see you again soon. Uh, shout out to you, Robert. <laughs>